No game has ever had as much hype to live up to as Grand Theft Auto San Andreas. It had some enormous shoes to fill because the two games that preceded it were classics, but it not only met expectations, it blew them away. Set in the early 90s in a city full of gangs and drugs, Grand Theft Auto is an epic game with storytelling and action that makes it a masterpiece. Rockstar Games has done it again. Ladies and gentlemen, Grand Theft Auto, San Andreas. Couldn't have put it better myself, Tony Hawk. Here we are, the final part of the original GTA trilogy. Sure hope I come up with a more creative title than San Andreas 18 years later. After the back-to-back -back successes of GTA 3 and Vice City, to say there was a lot of hype surrounding San Andreas would be an understatement. The two-year gap between it and Vice City created tons of discussions and rumors about what this new game was going to be like. It was all anyone I knew would talk about, and around this time I finally got a computer with internet access. So I was on gaming forums trying to find out anything I could about the game. Then the trailers were released, building up even more hype. You had a bigger world to explore, with different cities, small towns, and tons of countryside. Not limited to just land either, as you can now swim and explore underwater. For the first time, your character was now customizable being able to change his hairstyle, facial hair, tattoos, clothing, and more. And the game even added some pseudo-RPG elements. The story and setting was influenced by hood movies from the late 80s and early 90s, the soundtrack now leaning heavily into rap and hip-hop. Not for everyone, I know, but if you were in high school during the mid-2000s, you know every kid was suddenly about 50 Cent, G-Unit, and Eminem swearing up and down they were OGs who grew up on Tupac and Biggie Smalls. Then finally in October of 2004, the game was released and I loved it. San Andreas along with Pokemon Sapphire was my life throughout my early high school years. My school notebook was filled with cheat codes for San Andreas. I bet most of you remember this one. And the pages were also filled with my Pokemon fanfiction set in Hoenn. But that's a story for another day. San Andreas was my favorite GTA game for the longest time, but it's been a few years since my last playthrough. So let's dive in and find out why younger me loved it so much, and if it still holds up. Now get comfy, because this is going to be another long one. Five years on the East Coast, it was time to go home. Welcome to Los Santos Airport. What's up? Call the sweet. What's up, sweet? What you want? This mama. She's dead, bro. The year is 1992. Carl Johnson, aka CJ, leaves Liberty City and returns to Los Santos after the death of his mother in a drive-by shooting. CJ left Los Santos five years before the beginning of the game, due to the death of his younger brother Brian, an event he still blames himself to this day. It's never elaborated on on how Brian died, but it's implied through some dialogue that he may have been killed in a gang shooting. Not too long after arriving in Los Santos, CJ's taxi is stopped by the police. The cops tossing him into their cruiser and stealing all the money he had on him. These oh-so-honorable servants of the law are Officers Tenpenny, Pulaski, and the rookie officer Hernandez. Tenpenny is voiced by Samuel L. Jackson, and Pulaski by the late Chris Penn. Right away, the game establishes that CJ and Tenpenny have some kind of history. CJ less than surprised that the police picked him up once he was in Los Santos again and Tenpenny wasting no time in antagonizing Carl, disregarding his claims that he's clean and on the straight and narrow. During their car ride, the crooked cops plant a gun on CJ, claim that it was used to kill another police officer not just 10 minutes ago. Well, that's a good thing we found you and retrieved the murder weapon. That ain't my gun. Don't bullshit me, Carl. Yeah, don't bullshit him, Carl. What? Tenpenny uses the planted evidence to bring CJ under his servitude, informing him he'll be in touch when he's needed before tossing his ass out of the car. Oh shit, here we go again. Worst place in the world. Rolling Heights, baller country. 
And I ain't represented Grove Street in five years. But the ballers won't give a shit. Stuck in rival gang territory, I finally get control of CJ. And have to huff it back to his mom's house on Grove Street. Thankfully, we got a handy bike to make the trip easier. Bikes, as in a regular motorless bike, are new to the series and work like they do in Bully, mashing X to go faster and being able to do a little bunny hop. Not really my vehicle of choice when replaying San Andreas, but there's a fun little novelty to it. When I was younger, I remember just pedaling around San Andreas and trying to do stunts, along with making use of the moon jump code. I think I was more attached to it then, if only because of how much I loved Dave Mira's BMX as a kid. Returning to his childhood home, CJ is distraught, walking around the house, looking over a picture of his mother. He has a sort of flashback, it's just voices and no images. Hearing his younger self interacting with his brother Brian and sister Kendall. As he sits down to stare at the photo, he's interrupted by someone coming out of the kitchen. You picked the wrong house, fool! Hey, 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 Big Smoke, it's me, Carl, chill, chill! CJ. Oh my dog, what's up? <laughs> hey baby, you okay man? This is Big Smoke, an old friend of CJ's and current member of the Grove Street families. He comes off as a genuinely nice and concerned friend, asking CJ how he's dealing with the death of his mother, while also promising he'll get to the bottom of finding out who did it, quoting the Bible, or attempting to anyway, as a way to put his distraught friend at ease. The pair then head to the cemetery in order to meet up with CJ's siblings and attend his mother's funeral. Here, we're introduced to his younger sister, Kendall, who's happy to see her brother. Carl, hey, good to see you. And his older brother, Sweet, leader of the Grove Street families and who's less than happy to see CJ. That's another funeral you ran away from, fool. Just like Brian's. He immediately gives him shit for running away to Los Santos and not being here when his mother died. Sweet fully embraces the gangster lifestyle and is unable to see a life other than living in the hood with his homies, chastising CJ's attempts to better himself and live a better life, treating it as him abandoning his home and acting like he's better than others. Something that reminds me of Luis's situation in The Ballad of Gay Tony, where his family and old friends treated him as stuck up for trying to better himself. The funeral is cut short when some ballas attempt to drive by on the group with everyone running back to Grove Street, and CJ promising Sweet he's sticking around this time. His mom's house will now act as a safe house during this early portion of the game. Now we can do the first proper mission of the game, working with another member of Grove Street and another old friend, Ryder. Yeah, homie, yeah, yeah, it's good to see you back. No homie love? No huh? Oh, for sure, for sure, my nigga, my bad. What's cracking with you? He was at the funeral before, and is basically the rapper Easy e appearance-wise, anyhow. While Big Smoke was nice and respectful to CJ, Ryder's the opposite, and is pretty much an asshole. Constantly giving him shit about everything, from his appearance, to the way he drives, how he left the hood, and always calling him a buster. He's also almost always high or in the middle of smoking anytime you drop in on him. For his first mission, Ryder asks for CJ's help in pulling off a robbery. And on the way there, he tells CJ to get rid of that yee yee ass haircut, formally introducing the barbershops. You don't get a lot to choose from at first, as some looks can be a bit pricey this early in the game, but you can customize CJ's look to personalize him more to your liking. This was another feature I had more fun with as a kid, as I was constantly changing up his look, trying to make CJ look goofy or badass depending on my mood. I didn't miss it much in GTA 4, and didn't use it at all in GTA 5. I think mainly because I prefer this kind of customization when it's your own player created character, since it serves more as a way for me to role play or self insert, as opposed to CJ who has his own story and moral compass. On the topic of role play, San Andreas adds some RPG elements in the form of stats you can level up for CJ. There are five main stats you can view for CJ by pressing L1 on the hub but a lot more can be viewed when pausing and choosing the stat screen. First, there's respect. CJ's standing with the Grove Street families. With his respect increasing after most missions, when he kills rival gang members, takes over their territory, or kills the police. 
The more respect he has, the more members of Grove Street he can recruit to bring along on missions to assist. Though their effectiveness leaves a lot to be desired. But I'll get into that later. Next we got Stamina. How far you can run, cycle, or swim before CJ gets winded and has to stop. Easily built up by just doing all of those things, or using the treadmill at the local gym. The muscle stat determines how swole CJ is, letting him hit harder with melee attacks, increasing his sex appeal with the ladies, and changing his model to look more muscular. Like stamina, you can hit the gym and start lifting weights to increase muscle, unlocking more melee moves for CJ as well once he hits a certain milestone. Opposite of the muscle stat is fat which increases when CJ overeats food from any of the fast food places and restaurants in the game. The food places act as the main way to heal outside of missions, being able to order different meals that heal various amounts of health, and for pretty cheap too. I have to say, I like the way they did all the different restaurants in the game, as depending on the food they're serving, they'll look pretty different from each other indoors. With their employees wearing distinct uniforms and having different personalities, as some clearly hate their job compared to others, the guy at Clucking Bell not even hiding his disdain for customers, CJ's appearance and dialogue changes as he gains weight, and becomes a detriment to his health and stamina if he gets too big. But you still want to keep some fat on you, as CJ will get hungry and have to eat regularly. And if he's got no body fat, then his muscle starts to decrease instead. I swear, I feel like everyone hated this eating mechanic back when it first came out, Complaining constantly about having to take CJ to a fast food place like it was interrupting the game. But like the friends mechanic in GTA 4, I feel like it was overblown. As CJ doesn't have to eat that often. And since eating recovers your health, most likely you were going to stop by somewhere before starting a new mission if you were hurt. Seems like another one of those instances where it only felt annoying because the younger fanbase didn't have the patience for it. Sex appeal is the final stat shown on the main hub indicating how popular CJ is with the ladies. It's controlled by a number of factors, from CJ's haircut, the way he's dressed, his body type, and what type of car he's driving. The more expensive his ride and look, the more attractive he looks. Receiving positive comments from NPCs around the map, while also affecting his ability to date certain women. But I'll talk about girlfriends later. The remaining stats are lung capacity, how long CJ can dive underwater without running out of breath and drowning. Increased by diving underwater and surfacing without drowning. Vehicle skill, which is divided up among the different vehicles CJ can drive. Improving how well a car, bike, or plane handles. And finally, weapon skill, which is divided up among the different weapon types in the game. The more he uses a weapon, the more proficient CJ will get with it. Increasing accuracy, distance he can target someone, rate of fire, and whether he can shoot and move at the same time. Certain guns when fully maxed out will also let CJ dual wield them, like the pistols or the machine guns. Managing all these stats might seem daunting at first, but it's as easy as just doing the thing to level up the thing. So it'll end up happening naturally throughout your playthrough. And outside of two instances, you never have to get a certain stat to a certain level. Alright, now what were we doing again? Oh right, robbing a pizza place. Since this is Ryder's bright idea, I'm sure you can project how well the whole thing goes. Give up the money! This away! Ryder, not this again! It ain't me, fool! No one else is that small. I feel sorry for your dad. Shit, you crazy! Let's get up out of here! Same old CJ. Buster. Straight Buster. Oh shit! Run! After escaping and getting that Buster home, CJ can head over to help out Sweet. Sweet wants to show that Grove Street is making a comeback, and ain't to be messed with, asking his brother to drive out to Bala Turf to do some tagging. Not quite up to Banksy's level, but I dig it. Tagging works as an optional collectible, like hidden packages in the last two games, being able to paint over the tags of rival gangs. Once you've found and tagged all the gang graffiti, a few weapons will now always spawn at CJ's house. Along with upgrading Grove Street gang members with better weapons when they're walking around and when you recruit them. This mission also introduces another first to the series. Climbing. As you can now climb up fences and walls of a certain height. 
This makes verticality easier compared to the previous two games, allowing you to climb up certain buildings to look for secrets or get a better vantage point on your enemies, all without the need for a helicopter. Improving the game's overall level design during missions and in some instances, making it easier to run from enemies if you're cornered or don't have a car. After helping Sweet and escaping the Ballas, you'll have 5 tags taken care of from your count of 100. And you can now grab spray paint from your kitchen when you need it. Before starting the next mission, CJ will get a call from Officer Hernandez, the silent cop who was with Tenpenny and Pulaski. He warns you the cops are watching CJ and not to leave town. This is the game's way of keeping the player in Los Santos, as unlike the last two games, you don't have broken bridges that will stop you from exploring the rest of the map early. Instead, you'll get a high wanted level when trying to enter the other major areas. The police either killing you or forcing you to turn back. Checking on Sweet and the boys, they discuss how crack dealers have ruined the neighborhoods. Drugs being responsible for the escalating violence in the hood, mirroring the real-life crack epidemic of the 80s and early 90s. Grove Street's refusal to deal in drugs is partially responsible for the gang's fall in power and causing them to splinter off into smaller groups. Sweet sends CJ and Ryder to deal with a local dealer named B-Dub, with the pair running into an old friend named Big Bear, who works for the dealer now. The only thing Bear give a fuck about is smoking and keeping my house clean. Ain't that right, Big Bear? Hell yeah. Hell yeah what? Hell yeah, sir! Crack has left the guy a shell of his former self as now he's basically B-Dub's slave and muscle in exchange for another drug hit. CJ takes pity on Big Bear and leaves without violence. So instead they decide to beat up a local dealer before killing some ballers in a crack den. Remember kids, Drugs are bad. You shouldn't do drugs. Man, giving back to the community by killing drug dealers sure left me hungry. I should get the crew together to get something to eat. Hey, I'll take a number nine. Fat boy. Give me a number nine, just like his. Uh, let me get a number six with extra dip. I'll have two number nines, a number nine large, a number six with extra dip, a number seven, two number 45s, one with cheese, and a large soap. Before we can enjoy our delicious chicken, we spot a baller's car on its way back to the grove. So the boys will give chase with CJ driving as Sweet and Ryder fire on the car. After the ballers are dealt with, we'll drive Big Smoke back to his place a few blocks away from Grove Street. Afterwards, Sweet will call up and gyms will be unlocked for CJ to work out at. With the escalating violence, it's time for CJ to put in some real work. Instead of acting as a glorified chauffeur. So Big Smoke will take him to the local arms dealer and possibly senile old man, Emmett. The mission serves to reintroduce the shooting mechanics and show off Big Smoke's sick moves. Cap your ass and your ass. You want some too? Ice cold, baby. I knew I was the chosen one. Oh man, check out Special Agent Big Smoke. Nothing much to it. The lock-on feels more reliable than Vice City, and now you can instantly blow up cars by aiming for their gas tanks, just like in real life. Honestly, I can't think of a single time I found this useful, as most of the time cars are mobile and that tiny target is close to impossible to hit. Usually I end up hitting it by mistake, causing an explosion and getting caught in the blast by accident. Emmett will be the source of a free gun until ammunition is unlocked later. You can also dress up CJ now as clothing shops are unlocked. Aw yeah, looking fly playa. Like I mentioned towards the beginning, there's a lot more customization to dressing up CJ. Choosing a shirt, pants, shoes, hats, or shades. The game encourages the player to change up their style, as CJ's default tank top and jeans are kind of boring. And his friends insist he starts wearing Grove Street's green gang colors. After buying new threads, we put our newfound gun skills to use in a drive-by. Taking out several sets of ballas and learning where the local paint spray is. Later, Sweet calls up for help as he was pinned down by a rival gang while visiting his girl, needing CJ to fight his way through them and help his brother escape. Getting dragged into our siblings' love lives again, Sweet doesn't like Kendall dating a member of the Los Aztecas gang. Some things ain't just meant to happen. I mean, what if y'all have kids? Leroy Hernandez? That don't sound his good, girl. His name ain't Hernandez. Well, Leroy Lopez Leroy did. Leroy Lopez either, you racist fuck. 
He's totally not racist though. It's a gang thing, you know? So we have to follow Kendall to the local lowrider competition to meet her and her man. Which requires a lowrider of our own. Sweet will send us to his friend's garage to pick up a car. And this is where car modification is introduced. Limited to lowriders at first, you can change the paint job of your car, its wheels, add hydraulics, and even add nitrous. This was another cool addition at the time of the game's release, and I'm sure racing game fans loved it too. Tricking out their rides, showing them off, and flipping out when you inevitably end up destroying it. Again, not my thing, but if anything, I do like that when later garages are unlocked. I do have some kind of control over my car's paint job, as opposed to the paint spray where it's random each time. Rolling up to the competition, it's just a simple rhythm game matching the directional inputs to the beat of the music to move the car. It's so easy, it's one of the better ways to make some quick cash in the early game. As most of these missions for the hood have only paid you in respect. Kind of like in GTA 5. Huh. Guess Rockstar was more committed to recreating that San Andreas experience than I realized. After winning, we finally meet Kendall's boyfriend. Caesar, the leader of the Los Aztecas. Que onda? Nice hopping, Holmes. Well, you just shook that whatever's hand. Come here, baby girl. Hey, get your dirty hands off my oh, sister. what is wrong with you? Holmes, you're acting like she's your woman, eh? She's with me, cabron. So chill the fuck out. It's a rocky first impression, CJ acting possessive of his sister-like sweet. And Caesar's friends trying to start some shit with CJ. But Caesar smooths things over and promises he really does love Kendall. And that he'll always protect her. There isn't a lot to his character yet. But as the game goes on, he'll eventually become CJ's closest confidant. This wraps up the missions for Sweet. So now I move on to helping Big Smoke. First, we tag along to pick up an old friend recently released from jail. Jeffrey. Hey man, it's OG Loke, homie! OG Loke! Ah, right. OG Loke is basically that guy you know from high school who swore he was going to be a rapper, but lacked the actual, you know, talent to ever really succeed. Thinking a name, a look, and acting like a wannabe gangster was enough to make it. You younger kids probably know them as SoundCloud rappers, or those guys who lip sync on TikTok. OG Loke asks for some help getting revenge on some essay named Freddy, who stole his rhymes while in jail. But the conversation on the way to the mission, along with dialogue from the guy when we meet him, makes it obvious Loke wants him dead for making him his prison bitch. Confronting Freddy at his place, he takes off on his bike, with CJ chasing him while Loke shoots at him. If you keep up with Freddy and Loke manages to hit the guy, or you somehow got your own machine gun, you can kill Freddy during the chase. Otherwise, he'll lead you all around Los Santos and back to an ambush. This is the first mission to make use of the skip trip feature. As if you fail, when you redo the mission, you can skip picking up OG Loke and go straight to Freddy's house. I love this feature, as a lot of missions go on for a while, so having to redo certain segments of it can really drag out the experience. After Freddy's taken care of, CJ will drop off OG Loke at his new job at Burger Shot, unlocking him as a mission giver. Returning to Big Smoke, we briefly bump into Tenpenny and Pulaski. Boom! Asshole. Yo Carl, see you around! <laughs> Looks like CJ isn't the only one they're giving a hard time. Smoke needs help picking up his cousin who just came in from Mexico. We even get to hear his impeccable Spanish-speaking ability. Hey, excuse me, Jose. Yo soy el grando Smokio, and I want that grass, comprende? <laughs> hey, fuck you, cabrón. What? Now that ain't nice. Coffee-o up El Wido before I blow your brains out all over the patio. Chinga tu madre, pendejo. Oh, did I say cousin? I meant to say weed. We're ripping off some Vargos dealers. We're not done with the Vargos yet, though. And next, it's one of the most memorable missions of San Andreas. All we had to do was follow the damn train, CJ. All we had to do was follow the damn train, CJ. All we had to do was follow the damn train, CJ. Yeah, this one is pretty infamous. Having to chase down the Vargos while they're on the train. While Smoke shoots and tries to kill them from the back of the bike. But because of the height of the train, 
smoke's terrible shooting, and the occasional obstacle on the track, it could be a real pain in the ass to kill them, as it feels like RNG whether smoke actually manages to hit them. This time around, I did manage to do it in one go. Don't know if I just memorized the mission from sucking at it so much as a kid, or if I lucked out and found that magic sweet spot where the bullets actually land. The final mission for Smoke is the biggest set piece so far, as we end up having to fight our way through a building full of Russian mob goons while protecting Smoke, ending in an awesome chase sequence where we have to escape the Russians in a giant truck, with a scene ripped straight out of Terminator 2. Wrapped up with Big Smoke, it's time to head back to that Buster Rider. Damn! Hey, what you doing? Digging graves? Damn, where the fuck I put it, man? Put what, nigga? Man, the fucking water! After watching him try and fail to find some drugs he buried in his yard, he wants help in stealing weapons from a local army vet. They'll grab a delivery truck and wait till it's dark to head over to the man's house to rob him with CJ needing to sneak in and move around quietly to avoid waking him up. After you grab the boxes of weapons and take them back out to the truck, you'll unlock home invasions as a way of making extra cash. Returning to Ryder, Tenpenny and his lackeys reappear. Mmm, smells good. What's cooking? Where's mine? Picking up some drugs from Ryder before ordering both boys to go rob a train. Man, these assholes just have everyone in the hood doing things for them, huh? The train robbery itself involves CJ climbing onto its flatbed to grab weapon crates and toss them back at Ryder as he follows behind him. The final job for this idiot involves robbing a National Guard depot of weapons, which is a lot easier than you'd expect. You only have to deal with a few guards and the main bulk of the mission is just using a forklift to load crates onto a truck. Man, what is this, Shenmue? Done with Ryder, it's time to check in on OG Loke and see how he's doing at his new job as a hygiene technician. Looking real technical, gangster. Come. <laughs> you ain't run off again yet? Fed up with his job as a janitor, he wants to throw a big house party to kick off his rap career. So our first objective is to steal a DJ's sound equipment, wooing her with our six dance moves before stealing her ride. <laughs> Returning to OG Loke, his rhymes aren't getting the approval he was hoping for, as this random customer kindly explains to him. <laughs> hey, 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 it's OG Loke, homie, and I'ma kick a little something like this. Hey, yo, when I come through, open the place, you don't want me to come with a gun in your face. I spit it hotter than anybody in the yo, world could do. That it's shit like I sucks. Damn. So CJ suggests he have someone else write his rhymes. But Loke goes a step further and asks us to steal the rhyme book of a big name rapper, Mad Dog. It's a stealth mission, needing you to head to Mad Dog's mansion and sneak past his guards to get his rhyme book, making use of the shadows to hide and move around guards, even getting the option for stealth kills by using a knife and crouching behind a guard to kill them. While simple, I dig this little stealth mission, as the devs did a decent job fleshing out the mechanics, as a few future missions will give you the option for a stealthy approach instead of going guns blazing. Returning to Loke, we're not done with Mad Dog quite yet, as his manager has allegedly been blacklisting OG Loke, telling other agencies and managers that the would-be rapper's rhymes and skills are whack, and he isn't worth hiring, which, you know, is true. But we need to help Loke, by eliminating said manager. First by stealing a car belonging to one of his drivers, getting in a lineup and picking him up from a premiere, and then driving the car into the ocean and letting him swim at the fishes. With that, it's time for the house party. But OG Loke's uh, glorious debut is interrupted by the ballas, 
The gangbangers bring a small army to attack Grove Street, with the whole hood having to work together to fight them off. Man, all this gang violence is really starting to escalate. Before you could start planning on what to do about the ballas, Officer Tenpenny calls up to put CJ to work. Hey, Carl Johnson! CJ! Oh, shit. Come on over here, son! Frank Tenpenny shares a lot of similarities with Denzel Washington's character Alonzo Harris from the movie Training Day. A corrupt cop who acts like he's untouchable, abuses his authority, regularly does drugs on the job, steals from criminals, and runs a corrupt unit of like-minded cops. Behaving more like a criminal in his demeanor and how he speaks than a decorated officer of the law. CJ will meet with Tenpenny and the other members of the crash police unit at the local donut shop, being ordered to take care of a drug-dealing, cop-killing Bargos gangster. You'll be provided with some Molotovs for the mission, having to throw them through the windows of the gangster's house to burn it down and kill him. Unfortunately, an innocent girl is trapped inside, so CJ will have to run in to save her, putting out fires in order to escape the blazing inferno. Getting her to safety, she introduces herself as Denise, who just so happens to live down the road from Grove Street. Falling in love with CJ after he saves her life, she'll now become his girlfriend. The first of potentially several more. Girlfriends and dating are another new mechanic introduced in San Andreas. Outside of Denise and one other girl I'll bring up later, girlfriends are optional and can be found hidden throughout the game. You'll know if a woman is dateable when you see a blue arrow above their head. But you can't date them right away. CJ needs to have a decently high sex appeal, but more importantly needs to fit the girl's taste, usually by having the right body type they're interested in. Once they like what they see, CJ can take them out on dates to restaurants or to go dancing. As your relationship status with them grows, you'll unlock perks for dating them. One potential girlfriend makes it so you can keep your weapons after dying and respawning at the hospital, while another owns her own car garage that can be used as a free pay and spray. Get your relationship status with them high enough and you can drive their personal rides, unlock new outfits, and eventually be invited into their homes for some hot coffee. Well, can't discuss San Andreas without going into the whole hot coffee controversy. Grand Theft Auto has been no stranger to controversy, constantly being attacked by the media and politicians for being violent murder simulators. I didn't discuss it in the Vice City video, but it landed in hot water due to the missions relating to the Cubans and the Haitians, with both real-life groups protesting the game for depicting them as criminals, and possibly propagating harsh stereotypes about them. This resulted in future releases of Vice City removing any mention of the Cubans and Haitians, and just giving them regular gang names. But this was nothing compared to the shitstorm that the hot coffee incident caused. Buried in the code of the initial release of the game was a scrapped minigame referred to as Hot Coffee, where CJ would crudely have sex with his girlfriends. It wasn't particularly explicit stuff, and could only be accessed by modding the game or using a cheat device. But once it was discovered, all hell broke loose. Politicians and lawyers swarmed on the game, spearheaded by gaming's former enemy, Jack Thompson. The media misrepresented how easy it was to access the minigame, and painted Rockstar and Take-Two in a bad light, with the ESRB re-rating the game adults only, forcing retailers to pull the game from their shelves. Take-Two would have to stop production of the game in order to scrub the minigame from the code and get it re-rated, eliminating any traces of hot coffee in subsequent releases, along with paying tons of money in fines and lawsuits. All for a minigame that looks like two action figures smashing against each other. Man, talk about crazy. As it's pretty tame nowadays compared to the sex scenes you see in games like The Witcher. Or, ugh, The Last of Us 2. So glad we've all grown and video games aren't criticized for their sexual content or used as scapegoats for violence by out-of-touch politicians anymore. Returning to Tenpenny, he sends CJ down to the docks to interrupt a deal with the ballers and the Russians. Finished with the cops for now, it's time to go help out Grove Street again. Sweet will call up CJ, telling him to take care of a former member of the gang named Little Weasel, who swapped sides and joined the ballers. This is when ammunition will be unlocked, and you'll need to gear up with some new weapons before heading to Little Weasel's location in Glen Park. And here is where we're introduced to the gang warfare mechanic, 
Gang warfare has the various groups in Los Santos fighting for power and trying to take over each other's territory. The map of Los Santos will be divided up into different turfs, color-coded to match the controlling gang. Green representing Grove Street, purple representing the Balas, and yellow representing the Vagos. In order to take over a territory, you need to walk into a rival's turf and kill at least three gang members in order to start a gang war. You then have to kill three waves of enemies of increasing difficulty, surviving in order to claim the territory as yours. Depending on how high your respect is, you can recruit some Grove Street members to assist, which you do by aiming at them and pressing up on the directional pad. The territory you control will bring in a passive income that you can collect outside CJ's house. While interesting, I've got several issues with gang warfare. First is that trying to initiate a war to take territory can be a pain in the ass sometimes. Because of the way the game spawns NPCs, there might not be enough guys around to kill and actually start the takeover. Feels like more times than not, I'd have to run circles around a territory until they'd finally spawn, usually happening in the smaller turfs. Next is that your homies are absolutely useless. Their AI would constantly break during these fights, so even when giving them directions to follow, they'd either stay in one place, refuse to fight, or end up in my line of fire and getting killed. And finally, you have to protect your territory after you've claimed it. It doesn't happen all the time, but man, it seems to have a habit of occurring at the worst possible moment. The map will start flashing with an icon representing a gang attacking your territory. So you have to race from wherever you are back to that area. And fight off the gang or risk losing the territory and having to reclaim it all over again. It just feels like such a tedious mechanic, with the rewards not feeling worth it. Thankfully, you're not forced to take over every square of the map, even if you're doing 100% completion, but gang warfare resurfaces in an ugly way towards the end of the game. After killing Little Weasel, CJ, Sweet, and some guys you recruit from the Grove will ambush the Balls at his funeral, killing one of their high-ranking members. Later, Sweet will head to a meeting with the heads of the other former Grove Street families, hoping to merge the groups back together into a stronger gang. But the meeting ends up ambushed by the Los Santos Police Department. Big Smoke and Ryder end up ditching CJ, so it's up to him to try and save Sweet on his own. Fighting through the cops, he eventually finds Sweet and the two escape the building, just in time for their friends to return. Thanks a lot, assholes, but I guess it's the thought that counts. Afterwards, it's one long sequence of trying to fight off the police as the group tries to get away, with a police copter trying to ram into the guys. Oh, man, we gonna die! Oh, shit! It all ends with them crashing their car through a billboard and going up in flames. Though, thankfully, the crew managed to jump out at the last minute. Man, what a wild ride. But you know... I think the whole experience really brought the crew together. Fighting off the cops, escaping and nearly dying. The whole thing really makes me appreciate my homies. It's truly Grove Street for life. Empowered by the whole experience, Sweet rallies Grove Street together for an ambush on a ballers meeting. Before CJ can head over and back up his brother, he gets a call from Caesar, who needs to show him something important but can't tell him over the phone. Meeting him in his car, they spy on some balls across the street, and the truth behind the death of CJ's mom is revealed. So, some ballers hanging around a dope spot. So what? Just watch, homie. What the fuck? Oh, no. Nah. Shit, Smoke, what you into? Shh, that's it. Look at that ride. That's the motherfucking green saber. Big Smoke and Ryder have been in league with the Ballas and Tenpenny this entire time. The Green Saber responsible for the initial drive-by shooting that killed his mom had been hidden away at this garage the entire time. I really love this reveal. Easily the best twist in any GTA game. In GTA 3, Salvatore betraying Claude comes out of nowhere and gets terribly explained away as Maria lying to him about her and Claude being an item. In Vice City, Lance's betrayal is foreshadowed 
but feels unjustified due to his whiny and entitled attitude. But here it's just perfect. As looking back at earlier events, Ryder and Smoke's betrayal was being heavily foreshadowed. It starts as early as Big Smoke's introduction, as it's never properly explained what he was doing in the Johnson house before CJ arrived, possibly cleaning up the scene of the crime or hiding some evidence. Then we have all those times you would see Tenpenny show up at Smoke or Ryder's place, which at first is framed like Crash is using them like they are CJ. But knowing what we know now, it's clear the group were meeting to discuss and plan out their scheme. Then there's small things like how Big Smoke didn't fire on the ballers after their trip to Cluckin' Bell, just eating food in the back seat instead. Or how after the mission you drop him off at his house, which isn't on Grove Street and located smack dab in baller territory. The final nail in the coffin being the previous mission, where the two outright abandoned CJ and Sweet when the meeting of Grove Street families got attacked by the police. Like the two knew it was a setup all along. CJ doesn't get much time to dwell on this revelation, as he realizes that Sweet and the other Grove Street members have walked into a trap. Rushing to his aid, he fights off the ballers and finds that Sweet has been shot. After killing every baller there, the cops surround the two brothers, forcing CJ to surrender and bringing our time in Los Santos to an end. At least for now. You got a bag over your head, boy. How you feel about that? Man, take it off. Please, man. I can't breathe. Please. Oh, all right. But only because you said please. After the events of the last mission, CJ was grabbed and scurried away from the scene by Tenpenny and Pulaski. They fill him in that his brother is alive in a prison hospital. His sister Kendall and Caesar are safe, but with the cops keeping an eye on them. In no uncertain terms, CJ is fucked once again made to be Crash's errand boy. Warned to stay away from smoke. You'll now be stuck in some podunk town in the middle of the countryside. And you know what? I actually like it out here. It's a nice change of pace compared to the more crowded and dingy feeling of Los Santos, letting you breathe in this wide open space. With towns made up of smaller streets, homes, and businesses, locals dressed differently from those in Los Santos, riding cars more suited for the countryside. You can really take in the nature around this mountainous area. Well, as best as you can with PS2 graphics. The area around Mount Chiliad just invites exploration, with long stretches of driving and not encountering another soul making you wonder what you could possibly stumble onto. Is there any surprise that rumors around Bigfoot, ghosts, or serial killers being in the game were so popular around its release? Hell, if you're someone who's into liminal spaces, San Andreas is just a goldmine of it. From simple alleys to abandoned cottages or full-on abandoned towns. The diversity between its different areas really makes it one of the best and most memorable open worlds. CJ can't appreciate the countryside for long though, as Crash puts him to work as soon as they drop him off. He needs to climb up Mount Chiliad to find an informant who's planning to snitch on Tenpenny. Making our way up there and finding his cabin, he's being guarded by the FBI. So you'll have to sneak past them to get into the cabin and kill the guy. But if you spook him, you'll have to chase after him as he drives off and kill him before he gets away. Once the deed is done, take a snapshot of his corpse and return to the trailer back in town to send it to Tenpenny. Afterwards, you'll get two calls from Caesar and Sweet. Caesar fills us in on the state of things and suggests CJ go meet his cousin in order to get some help with his current situation. While Sweet calls from the prison hospital, checking in to see if CJ and Kendall are okay, and asking his brother to do what he can to get him out. Taking Caesar's advice, we head to the diner where his cousin is located, who turns out to be a familiar face. Do you want some fatso? You big string of Yankee piece? I sing fucking oh. units with more balls than you. What the fuck did you want? Nothing. I'm looking for a friend of mine's cousin, Come on, Mexican bitch. guy. He ain't here. You? But Cesar said you was a real man. Crazy. Lady, bitch. I'm a god fearing peace-loving man of the people. Whatever, asshole. Let's go. Damn, relax, baby. Yep, it's the sort of main villain of GTA 3, Catalina. Of all the people from these games, she was the last one I'd expect to make a reappearance. 
especially in a game set a decade before her debut. Catalina is just as unpleasant as she was in GTA 3. Maybe more so, as she's quick to anger, is constantly shouting, and tries to solve all her problems with violence. Kind of like a female Kratos. The younger Kratos, anyhow. Zeus, your son has returned! I bring the destruction of Olympus! Working with Catalina involves pulling off four different robberies around the countryside. The whole experience being treated like her and CJ are dating. Creating an unpleasant experience as Catalina constantly berates and belittles him, constantly calls his manhood into question, and criticizes just about his every move. Did I say they were dating? I'm sorry, sounds more like they're married. You can do the robberies in any order you like, with the closest one being a gas station in town. But instead of robbing the cashier for cash, we steal his fuel tanker instead. A simple mission to deliver the fuel to Catalina's contact, though the cashier and his buddy Derek will chase after and try to stop you. Gotta admire that dedication to the job. After completing the job, a mysterious stranger will call up to offer work, having been referred to CJ by Tenpenny. Returning to Angel Pine, we find Tenpenny having the time of his life. Somebody in there? In here. <sighs> Check this shit out. What do we have here? Yo, Carl. What up, kid? Welcome, friend. Sup? And we're introduced to the aging hippie known as the Truth. Instead of eliminating someone to cover up his corruption, Tenpenny more or less loans out CJ to the Truth in order to pay for weed he's buying from him. And despite being associated with an asshole crooked cop like Tenpenny, the truth is surprisingly pleasant. Definitely an out there weirdo, but he's nice to CJ and doesn't treat him like his whipping boy. He needs help harvesting his weed, which requires stealing a combine harvester from a nearby farm. Man, I love this mission. It's a simple steal and escape job, but any of the farmers you run over while escaping will be shredded to bits and shot out the back of the harvester as bloody meat chunks. And I always end up wasting time just running them over for fun. No, I'm not a psychopath. My dad just wasn't there for me growing up. And my mom went crazy and started chasing UFOs. Now we're gonna watch a four hour retrospective on Fallout New Vegas. Then you can leave. Dropping off the harvester to the truth, he says he'll reach back out once the Mary Jane is ready. Afterwards, Caesar will call and come out to Angel Pine with Kendall for their protection. Though he wants to head back to Los Santos to get rid of the drug pushers. Specifically Big Smoke. CJ is in denial about Big Smoke's betrayal. Unable to accept his former friend has fallen so far and is now dealing. But his sister and Caesar tell him to wake up. Pointing out he couldn't have afforded his current house any other way. I mean none of these guys seem to have actual jobs so they do have a good point. Caesar's also heard a rumor that Smoke regularly sends a truck out to San Fierro to pick up more dope. CJ convinces Caesar to chill and stay put for now, unlocking optional missions where he can disrupt Smoke's operation. They're not located on the map, but triggered on certain days of the week, with Caesar calling about either drugs or cash being moved. You have the choice to accept or decline the mission, with no penalty if you decide not to do it. But if you accept, you can either kill a drug courier working for Smoke, taking a backpack full of drugs and the mission payout determined by how much he had left in his bag. Or you can chase after a Patriot car transporting cash, smashing into or shooting it, letting you loot crates for a maximum payout of $1,800. I mostly ignored these and only ever did them once, mainly because Caesar always seemed to call when I was on the other side of the map, and I couldn't be bothered to drive all the way back to the countryside to do the jobs. Hello? Where'd you be, asshole? Why don't you call, eh? Well, I was just about to call you, but... Liar! You'll be hanging out with those sticky putas! No, no! If you just let me... It's silence! Get up here! We've got places to rob! Look, I'm in the middle of some shit, right? Oh, right. Guess we should go back to working with our new girlfriend. Meeting Catalina in her hideout, it's time to bang out the remaining robbery missions. First hitting up a betting shop and blowing it safe, then attempting to rob a liquor store before someone else beats us to it. 
So we chased him down and robbed them instead. And finally hitting up a small bank, fighting off and escaping the local police force. Afterwards, breaking up with Catalina. One day, Carl Johnson, you will realize she, she truly loved me and your heart will break in two. But you are more like this spiny lizard than a man. Goodbye. Oh, how will I ever recover from losing such a great catch as her? I think I'll just get into a crazy, illegal, cross-country race to clear my head. Caesar calls telling us about the race, and driving up to the starting line, we're introduced to who I consider the best character in the game. Woozy Moo, or Woozy as his friends call him. You haven't been to one of our meets before. Where are you from, friend? I'm from Grove Street Families, Los Santos. What's happening? Relax. This isn't a parade, pal. But you know, we gotta be careful. Wootsy Moo. But my friends call me Wootsy. How you doing? CJ. Carl Johnson. We don't learn much about him at first, but he's a leader of a triad clan and looks like Sarah from The Matrix Reloaded. This is a good movie, and I'm tired of pretending it's not. He's also very polite and nice to CJ, accepting his defeat in their race with Grace and offering CJ work if he's ever in San Piero. I don't want to spoil anything about him yet, but god do I love this guy. We'll have another race after this one, being introduced to Catalina's new man, and holy shit, it's Claude! This was such an awesome cameo. I mean, yeah, there isn't much to Claude at all, but it was cool to see him and find out what he was up to before he went to Liberty City. And now we know how he ended up meeting Catalina. Oh Claude. How I wish I could warn you what was going to happen a decade from now. Side note, I got this theory that GTA 6 is going to be about the HD games versions of Catalina and Claude. Mainly because of the news articles and leaks that say you'll be playing as a Bonnie and Clyde duo, with one of them confirmed as a Latina. Which fits these two's relationship to a T. As the pair would go on a crime spree before Catalina ends up betraying Claude. Hope I'm right, as it would be cool to see some old series characters brought into the new continuity. Though I'm not sure how they'd handle Claude. Like, would he still be mute, or would he have some kind of Commander Shepard dialogue options that determine his personality? Someone remind me to make a video on the first trailer for GTA 6 when it's released in 2-3 to three years. Getting back to the game, I whoop Claude's ass in the race, and instead of cash or a pink slip, Catalina gives me the deed to a garage in San Fierro, before she disappears from my life forever never to bother me ever again. Before I can head to my new business, the truth calls up so I can pick up the weed for Tenpenny. And it turns out Tenpenny played both of us, as the cops show up by chopper on the truth's farm to arrest us. We need to destroy the evidence using a flamethrower to destroy the weed. Exactly like that one mission in Far Cry 3, minus the dubstep. After sacrificing the Mary Jane, we blow the chopper out of the sky, and the two of us hop into the Truth's van to start our new lives in San Fierro. We finally made it gang, the city of love, San Fierro. If Los Santos was meant to be a combination of the poverty-stricken South Central, and the affluent but ultimately phony world of LA, San Fierro ends up mirroring San Francisco with its more upscale homes, diverse neighborhoods, tram system, and waterfront property. All it's missing is a massive homeless population and streets covered in shit and syringes. The city doesn't really feel as interesting to drive around like Los Santos, but I appreciate not getting shot at any time I turn the corner into a new neighborhood. CJ's dreams of running a legit business are dashed as soon as he and the truth arrive, as Catalina ends up scamming him with the deed to a broken down garage. Though I guess it might have belonged to Claude as he mainly complains about him. But after a pep talk from his sister and Caesar, he decides to get his hands dirty and just focus on turning the place around with their help. The truth recommends some people he knows that can help get things running at the garage, and asks CJ to drive him around to go pick them up while also seemingly avoiding someone following the truth around. The first two of his friends are Jethro and Dwayne, the two of them returning from Vice City. They were attached to the boat dock assets mission, working at the docks and greeting Tommy when he bought the business. 
The third person he has in mind is an electronics expert and owner of an RC shop, Zero, who is voiced by David Cross. With the crew working together to fix up the garage, Kendall suggests that CJ invest into buying property to make more money. This is where asset missions will be introduced, though they don't work quite the same as they did in Vice City. After buying an asset, you will have to do some missions in order for the business to start bringing in a passive income. They're mostly optional this time around, the only mandatory one being treated more like your usual story missions in its importance to the plot. Now that we're settled in a new location, it's not long before Tenpenny calls us up to put us to work again. Using the weed we got from the truth, he wants CJ to plant it on a DA investigating Tenpenny, and then call a tip line to report him. CJ will have to pose as a valet to steal the DA's car, take it back to his garage to plant the drugs, and then drive it back to the car park to call the snitch line. Returning to the garage, Kendall's upset after some local construction workers sexually harassed her and called her a hooker. So we must protect our sister's honor by tearing up the construction site with a bulldozer, before pushing a porta potty with the foreman inside into a hole, and pouring cement over it to bury him alive in a container of shit. Feels like a disproportionate punishment. I mean, yeah, he harassed Kendall, but maybe just giving him an ass whooping would have been fine. Burying him alive and shit seems a little harsh. After this, Jethro will call, subtly attacking CJ's driving ability and recommending he go to a local driving school. Going to the driving school and completing its challenges will cause your driving skill to level up fast, especially in comparison to the normal method where it slowly increases based off of how far CJ has driven. The challenges have CJ do things like performing burnouts, doing U-turns, or driving with pop tires. You need to get a score of at least 70% to pass the challenge and unlock the next one, being given a medal based on how well you did. The challenges can be frustrating as they require some near-perfect driving skills in order just to pass, with the better medals requiring almost superhuman levels of speed and control. The driving school is technically optional, but you need to complete the school before you can purchase the Wang Cars asset. And it's also required for 100% completion. Honestly, I can't tell how beneficial increasing your driving skill is. It's supposed to improve handling and let you make sharper turns. But depending on what you're driving, you may not even notice. Around this time, Caesar will call up. He's learned about a baller's car that was spotted driving up to San Fierro to buy drugs and thinks this might be their chance to find out the main players behind the drug syndicate in Los Santos. Driving out to meet Caesar, he and CJ return to Angel Pine to spy on the secret drug meeting going on, taking photos of everyone who shows up. They end up spotting that traitor Ryder, the leader of the San Fierro Rifa, T-Bone Mendez, a mysterious man in a black suit, and finally a pimp later identified as Jizzy B. Now that the pair know the main faces behind the Loco Drug Syndicate, they head back to San Fierro to form a plan to take them down. Hey, what up, Z? Nothing is up, Carl, apart from my blood pressure and the imminent collapse of my hopes and dreams. Why? As usual, the forces of darkness have triumphed over good. Around this time is when I finally had the funds to buy Zero's RC shop and unlock his asset missions, and tons of frustration. Zero's missions mainly have you assisting him in his war against his rival RC enthusiast, Berkeley. His first mission, Air Raid, isn't too bad, and just has you manning a turret to shoot down Berkeley's fleet of RC choppers, and protect Zero's antenna towers. The next mission, Supply Lines though, is on a whole other level, and easily the most frustrating mission of the entire game. After finding Zero hanging from his underwear in a closet, courtesy of Berkeley, he wants revenge. So you'll need to use an RC plane to disrupt Berkeley's RC business by killing his couriers around the city. But a combination of factors make this a lot harder to pull off than you'd think. First is the RC plane controls, which can feel stiff and slow, especially when you're trying to turn the plane. Next, in order to actually kill the couriers, you have to follow behind them and use machine guns to kill the courier or blow up their vans. But because the guns are front facing and the nose of the plane can move up and down as you're moving it on the road, it can be hard to be accurate unless you're right behind them. There's also the fact that some couriers will fight back and can destroy your plane while you fumble around trying to hit them. And finally, the couriers are spread out pretty far from each other, 
which at first may not seem too bad as the mission isn't timed and these guys drive pretty slow. But your plane does have a fuel gauge that's whittling away as you fly around trying to kill these guys. One that doesn't stop emptying after you kill everyone, as you're expected to fly back to Zero's shop in order to complete the mission. You have no idea how many times I failed because I ran out of fuel trying to get back to him. This mission just demands perfection, that you get the flight controls down, can kill the couriers fast, and can plan out the optimal route to take out the couriers and remain within flying distance of Zero's shop. Its only saving grace is that the mission is optional and you can just save yourself the hassle. And almost as if the devs knew most players would be frustrated after doing supply lines, the final mission for Zero is pitifully easy. Zero and Berkeley decide to settle their beef once and for all, engaging in a small-scale RC battle. Zero needs to get his RC car into Berkeley's base in order to win, so CJ will act as support with an RC chopper that has a magnet attached to it. You need to move obstacles out of his way, create bridges for him, and drop bombs on tanks that try to destroy his car. It's a fun little minigame, and I'm surprised they didn't turn it into some optional game you can play whenever, as I actually had some fun doing it. Berkeley Vanquish, this will complete the asset missions for Zero, and his shop will regularly generate a max of $5,000. Though, annoyingly, like Vice City, you still have to swing by the shop to collect the money, which isn't bad now, but can be really annoying once you leave San Fierro. Now let's get back to trying to take down the Loco Syndicate. <laughs> That's crazy, man. What are we looking at exactly? Hey, man, you get them flicks developed? What's up, woozy? Hey, Carl. I was just explaining to your brother-in-law that we were friends. Oh yeah? Returning to the garage, we're reunited with Woozy. He fills us in on who the members of the Loco Syndicate are and what their roles are in the organization. Well, technically one of his men fills us in. The mysterious man in black runs the whole operation, with Thibaut Mendez as the muscle and Jizzy working as the intermediary for drug deals. CJ decides that Jizzy will be his foot in the door to the organization, so he heads down to his club to meet him in person. See, baby, I got everything. Make sheets, make coats, make curtains in the wind. When I walk down the stairs, I'm walking down on mink car. Jizzy is voiced by the late Charlie Murphy, and is more or less his character Buck Nasty from The Chappelle Show. There isn't much to him outside of being a pimp and a tad narcissistic, as all it takes is CJ buttering him up a bit for Jizzy to trust him and bring him on board to work for him. He tests CJ by having him take on some of his pimping duties. Having him drop off one of his hoes at a client, kill a rival pimp, save another girl from her attackers, and then finally go back to kill the first girl he dropped off and her sugar daddy. And this is all just in the first mission for him too. Earning Jizzy's trust, we're one step closer to taking down the Loco Syndicate. But before going back to him, it's time to reconnect with our buddy Woozy. Reaching his place of business, one of Woozy's men informs CJ about Woozy's curse. That those shades he wears aren't because he's trying to act cool or cosplay from the Matrix. It's in fact because he's blind. Which isn't too surprising as if you're paying attention during his intro mission. It would explain his odd demeanor and not facing CJ or shaking his hand. Though it's kind of baffling as Woozy was able to drive in the race with seemingly no issues. Maybe he has daredevil-like senses or something. Let me reintroduce myself. I am the boss of the Mountain Plowboy. Nice to meet you. Likewise. Why don't you sit down? Speaking to Woozy, he formally introduces himself as the boss of the Mountain Cloud Boys. Afterwards, asking CJ to accompany him as he checks in on some local triads that missed their last meeting. Driving him over, he insists on leading the way. And well... What's wrong, you lost? Need a hand? No, no. I was just, you know, getting the feel of the place. Stick close. Maybe he doesn't have daredevil-like senses after all. Eventually, we stumble upon the bodies of the missing triads. One survivor filling us in that they were ambushed by a Vietnamese gang, who promptly return. You'll have to fight your way out of the alley while protecting Woozy. And once making it back to the car, let Woozy finish off your pursuers. He has surprisingly good aim for a blind man. Big Smoke should be embarrassed. Returning to Woozy, he introduces us to Ron Fa Lee, a higher ranked triad and boss of the Red Gecko Tong. His assistant explains that a Vietnamese gang, the Da Nang Boys, 
are planning on moving operations to San Andreas, explaining the earlier attack from the Vietnamese. They request assistance in picking up a package from the airport, with Luzi vouching for CJ and being able to get the job done. Driving out to where the car and package are located, CJ is ambushed by the Da Nang boys. He'll have to protect the car from being destroyed, escape the car park, and outrun the gang as they chase him to the Triad's garage. Back at Woozy's, Ron Fa Lee is keeping himself entertained playing video games, as he and his assistant can't leave. The Da Nang boys have followed them to Woozy's and are currently waiting for them to leave so they can kill them. CJ offers himself up as a decoy to lure them away so the pair can escape. You'll take the decoy car out to a spot in the countryside where the Da Nang boys will finally spring into action. You have to drive through checkpoints like you do in a race, leading the guys on bikes around while also making sure not to let the car get too damaged and blow your cover. This was a fun little mission, especially since it had been a few hours since I was in the countryside last, and because Freebird was playing on the radio. I just loved that song, and it happened to fit the situation by complete coincidence. The following mission for Woozy, Amphibious Assault, is the only mission that requires a skill check and can't be started unless CJ has a higher lung capacity. The mission will also play a special cutscene if you haven't reached the requirement yet. I need something taken care of. What? Hey man, quit trying to distract me. How are you in the water? What you mean, can I swim? Yeah, can you swim well? No, I can't. Shit! Man, damn! How you do that? <laughs> I'm not sure how high your lung capacity has to be, as there seems to be conflicting information, as the GTA wiki says it only needs to be above 5%, while some walkthroughs say it should be above 20%. I say aim for 20, as it only takes like 15 minutes of diving and rising in the water to level it up. I'll have two number nines, a number nine large, a number six with extra dip. Despite basically being Aquaman now, CJ is still a bit uncomfortable in the water, due to a condom hitting him in the face while swimming as a kid. This is where Woozy ends up dropping a bombshell on us. I have a confession to make. I, um... I'm blind. No shit! Since Woozy's super senses don't work in the water, CJ ends up agreeing to bug a Da Nang boy's ship for him. Heading to the docks, the game briefly has you practice your driving skills by swimming through some rings underwater before heading to the ship. You need to stay out of the ship lights and the guard's sight, diving underwater when you're spotted and waiting for them to leave before surfacing. On the ship, you'll need to sneak past all the guards and make your way down to plant the bug and finally escape back to shore. Returning to Woozy one last time, it's time to take care of the Da Nang boys once and for all. CJ will hop on a chopper with one of Woozy's men, flying over the ship and using a Gatling gun to pick off the guards. After a brief sequence, you'll get shot out of the sky and get stripped of all your weapons as you board the ship. You'll have to play it stealthy again to get past the guards and take their guns, till you're eventually spotted and have to fight your way down to the cargo hold. After freeing the refugees in the container, the last order of business is to head to the bridge to kill off the remaining Da Nang boys and their leader, who requests an honorable samurai duel. Too bad for him, I got the power of God and anime on my side. <laughs> Fleeing the ship with the refugees, this completes this set of missions for Woozy, so it's time to get back to dealing with the Loco Syndicate. Now this here is the dumb muscle that I was talking about. Carl T-Bone and in reverse. Suck. Returning to Jizzy's Pleasure Dome, we're formally introduced to T-Bone Mendez. Unlike Jizzy, he's a lot more level-headed and professional when it comes to their business, reminding the pimp what he signed up for when he starts complaining about his cut. He's also the first to suspect someone may be making a move against their group, which is proven correct when he's phoned that one of his drug vans was just ripped off. It's CJ to the rescue as he has to find and then chase down the bikers who ripped off the van. Though you don't necessarily have to kill them and can just steal the drugs off the back of their bikes when they're close enough. But killing them sure does make it a lot easier. 
Our next mission for the Loco Syndicate has CJ teaming up with Mendez as another one of their drug vans has been ripped off. The third big player in the Syndicate, Mike Torino, calls up to let them know he was in the back of the van when the drugs were snatched. You now have to drive around San Fierro using the sounds Torino hears to try and figure out where he is before his phone battery dies. Eventually, the pair deduce the vans at the airport. Racing there, they kill the thieves, and CJ is formally introduced to Mike Torino. About time, T-Bone. Who the fuck is this? Hey, that's one of Jizzy's clowns. Relax, Weddle. Not the friendliest guy in the world, huh? After Mendez vouches for CJ, the trio blow up the drug van and escape. Though Torino still grills CJ about who he is and what his intentions are, laying off once they arrive at Jizzy's. Afterwards, CJ will have to meet Mendez at the nearby gas station. Waiting for him there, it turns out the jig is up, and the local syndicate has gotten wise to what CJ has been up to. Uh, hey, you a pinchy hoot or what? Uh, what the hell? You think you can mess with me? Uh, I, I will blow your head off and rape and kill your family, you snake! Uh, you think you can fucking bullshit me and fuck me over? Uh, I know your uh, fucking uh, game, that's uh, it. <coughs> man, I'm just trying to make some money. Keep my mouth shut, I swear, man. <laughs> I almost had you, man. I almost fucking had you. Gotcha? Or not. Turns out Mendez was just fucking around. Torino joins them once they're done goofing around, and has CJ drive to the location of one of their drug shipments. He'll act as escort, following the van on bike and clearing out any potential roadblocks trying to rob them. A very easy mission really, you just have to get ahead of the van before it arrives at the roadblock and kill everyone there. You'll even be given a rocket launcher and sniper rifle to make the job easier. Mission complete, we're done working for the local syndicate and can finally plan out how to dismantle them. Before that though, CJ's two favorite people in the world drop by to give him a visit. Nice to see y'all kicking back. Oh. I wonder how your brother's sleeping curled up next to his shower daddy while you lived comfortably on the outside. In a nice change of pace, we're not covering up Tenpenny's corruption. This time, it's Pulaski's ass we have to cover, as some reporter has been investigating him. So as always, we need to rub them out. You'll first pick up a sniper rifle the cops left for you, then follow the reporter as he boards a train and rides it back to Los Santos. Once there, follow him to his contact and put them both down. Returning to San Fierro, Woozy has left CJ a message that the Syndicate and the Ballas are planning to meet again soon. So you'll need to kill Jizzy and get his phone in order to find the location and ambush the deal. This mission is confusing in its setup as at first it seems like it's supposed to be a stealth mission. As Caesar will give you a silenced pistol, and when arriving at Jizzy's club, you'll have to sneak in from the roof as his guards won't let you through the door. But once you get to him, CJ just confronts him instead of executing him, giving Jizzy enough time to sick his goons on you before he escapes. Then you have to follow his car and gun him down for his phone. Feels like they couldn't commit to an idea for this mission, as it's not even explained why CJ couldn't get into the club in the first place, outside of Jizzy just being busy. With his phone in hand, we find out the deal is taking place at Pier 69, CJ calling Caesar to meet him there. Joining him on a roof across from the meeting, Woozy's boys show up to assist. Though really, we're assisting them as we have to snipe Mendez's security to keep them alive. Once Mendez and his crew show up, along with Ryder and the Ballas, our ambush plan is thrown out the window when Torino's plane spots the bodies on the roof. The area turns into a war zone as CJ's crew engages the Ballas and Rifa. Well, I say that, but I don't see anyone else actually fighting them but me. Thanks a lot, jerks. Eventually, CJ and Caesar put down T-Bone Mendez for good. Mendez, I see you, Rifa, motherfucker! Leaving one loose end, Ryder. Can't stop me! He's in it for those boats! Don't worry about it, I got this! After he jumps off the pier, you're supposed to swim after him and get into a boat chase with him. But I really can't be bothered to do that and snipe his ass in the water. Later, Buster. Killing Ryder feels so anticlimactic. For someone who's supposed to be a longtime friend of CJ, 
was secretly working with the Balas and orchestrated the takeover of Grove Street when Sweet got locked up. He's treated like a disposable NPC during this mission. He doesn't have a cutscene where CJ confronts him or hell, any new dialogue for that matter. There's this fan theory that Ryder wasn't meant to turn traitor and it was rewritten that way late into development. The theory is assisted by the fact that after the Green Saber reveal, he's pretty much never mentioned. CJ almost always talks about smoke when it comes to the betrayal. He doesn't have any new dialogue either after the reveal. His lines in this mission all recycled from his previous appearances. There was a rumor going around that his voice actor, MC8, quit halfway during development, but that was debunked and doesn't hold much water, as MC8 returned to the series in GTA 5 with new music and to voice himself. Also, if he did quit, it would have made more sense to just recast him than try to rewrite the story around him. CJ does reflect on killing Ryder for about 5 seconds, then completely gets over his conflicted feelings of murdering his friend, when Caesar reveals Ryder tried to have sex with Kendall once. I don't know, maybe it's a mix of both things, like maybe Ryder was meant to die before the big smoke reveal, but the writers decided to make him a traitor and expand his role, but weren't able to get MC8 back to record more lines, and so they just cobbled together what they could and that's what we got. Who knows, maybe the devs will shed light on it one day. With Jizzy and Mendez dead, we only have Torino left to take care of. Woozy will call up with info on his location, his boys having spotted his van outside a helipad. We'll head down there and fight off his guards, but we're too slow to prevent him from flying off. So we have to grab this conveniently placed rocket launcher and chase him down the highway. Since I'm terrible at aiming, missing every shot as I follow him on the highway, Torino eventually takes pity on me and has his chopper stay still long enough for me to shoot it down. Thanks, Torino. You were an asshole, but at least you saved me from embarrassment. Despite the main players in the syndicate all being dead now, we still have one piece of business to take care of. Woozy's boy will once again call up. They need CJ to pick up a car they've wired with explosives to blow up the syndicate's crack factory. Once we have the car, we have to get into the factory, kill the guards, set the timer on the car to explode, and then escape before it blows. Having single-handedly ended the crack epidemic, I return to the garage to pat myself on the back, but receive a call from a mysterious stranger claiming to have some important info about Sweet. Who the fuck is this? I can't talk right now. Get your ass over here. Mom's always told me not to talk to strangers. And look what happened to the bitch. Now if you want your brother to go to sleep tonight with his tongue intact, get your ass over here. Goodbye. Ominous. But they sound trustworthy. Let's head out to the desert to meet this stranger. Pulling up to the guy's ranch, he isn't there. Speaking to us through his PA system instead. Before he'll reveal himself, he needs to see what we're made of. Which involves driving around in a monster truck for some reason. It doesn't really prove anything, outside of the fact that CJ is good at following orders, I guess. Really, it's just a flimsy way to familiarize the player with this new area. After we blow his tits off with our amazing drive through checkpoint skills, the mysterious stranger reveals himself. Hey, Carl. Hey, what the fuck, man? Hey, Torino, I, I told you my bad, man. What the hell can I say? I screwed you Calm over. Calm down, kid. Just go ahead and kill me then. Calm down. Man, you ain't number the fucking Yale dealer anyway, Torino. Shut up and sit down. Well, holy shit. It's Mike Torino. He's not dead after all. I mean, I think it was pretty obvious he wasn't dead, as we didn't see him at all during the mission where we supposedly killed him. Also, he's voiced by James Woods. Considering his talent and Hollywood status at the time, it'd be a waste to kill off his character so fast. Torino reveals he's actually a government agent and was using the Loco Syndicate as a front to fund his agency's operation in Latin America. Whoa, the US government deliberately flooding urban neighborhoods with drugs? In order to fund rebel efforts to overthrow communist governments? There's no way that would happen in real life, come on. Welp, he's got us by the balls, as unlike Tenpenny who's basically talking out of his ass half the time we see him, Torino has some real power, and defying him means some very unpleasant things happen to Sweet. Now under his leash, the first thing he wants us to do is steal a tanker from a rival agency. Because reasons. CJ will call up Caesar to assist, but keep him in the dark about why we're stealing the tanker. 
Hopping on a bike, you have to hijack the tanker while it's on the freeway. But Christ, it's annoying. You have to maintain speed with the tanker and stay close in order for Caesar to hop onto it. But it's seriously fickle about finding the right spot. And it doesn't help that there's still traffic around you as you're trying to pull it off. So you might crash into a car in front of you as you're trying to pull the job. Or that Caesar says the same thing every damn time as you're trying to do it. Returning to Torino after stealing the tanker, he now needs us to pick up some contraband from a plane coming into San Andreas. He first sends CJ out to some ghost town in the desert to pick up a rocket launcher, and then has him drive to the top of a mountain to signal the plane. Before it can make the drop, two agency choppers will try to intercept it, so you have to shoot them down before they destroy the plane. Keeping it safe, it drops the goods, but the dumbass pilot misses the drop zone and the package lands miles from the mountain. After picking it up, CJ has to go back to the ghost town from before to stash it, finishing the mission. Like the previous mission with the monster truck, this feels like the game trying to get the player to explore and get familiar with their surroundings again. As there's too much busy work involved having to drive all over the place. Back at Torino's ranch, CJ is starting to get fed up with all the work he's doing for him. Especially if he isn't going to free his brother. Torino gets him back in line immediately, revealing that they're keeping Sweet safe in jail and scaring CJ with the fact he's got a bounty on his head with other agencies and the Russians looking to collect on him. It's time for CJ to do some real wet work for him, which first requires that he buy an abandoned airfield outside Las Venturas. This is another asset mission like Zero's RC and Wang Cars, but the only mandatory one to progress the story. Also, despite Torino telling CJ to threaten the owners and offer them a dollar, you have to cough up 80k to buy the place which you should have if you haven't been spending too much cash buying guns or buying safe houses. Once you own the place, you can't continue the quest line for Torino yet, as first you have to complete the flying school missions. Thankfully the flying school is right there at the airfield and unlike the driving school, is a lot more reasonable with its challenges. Most of them being basic challenges to learn flight controls and fly through red rings. The only challenge that gave me any real trouble was trying to pull off a barrel roll as trying to spin the plane had a habit of shifting the camera, causing me to miss the corona constantly. After getting your wings, Woozy will call up to tell you about his new setup in Las Venturas. But I still need to finish up with Torino before I can meet him. Get you again, Carl! You're half asleep. I could have killed you in nine different ways. Wake up and smell the coffee. You need to lay off the coffee. After messing with CJ, Torino needs him to go drop some equipment off to some agents he has out in the field. You'll have to fly out there while also making sure to fly low and out of enemy radar, or risk getting shot down. This one can be annoying, as the visibility meter fills up fast if you fly too high, and the plane you're on can be slow to descend down to safety. There's also the fact that once you're in Angel Pine, there's a decent amount of pop-in occurring, so you may end up crashing into a tree when it looks seemingly safe. And there's a good chance this is where you'll find out the hard way not to fly over Area 69, a military base close to the airstrip, as they'll shoot you down quickly after entering their airspace. Returning to the airfield, CJ will be waiting around for Torino, when he's forced to hide when a bunch of feds show up and start raiding the place. Torino will sneak up on CJ and tell him that those feds belong to a rival agency, and he'll have to get on the plane and kill everyone on board. You'll need to hop on a bike to go after the plane as it takes off, avoiding the barrels it's dropping in order to board. Once on the plane, you'll have to gun down the agents inside before tossing a satchel charge onto the cargo and parachuting off before it explodes. Overall, a pretty cool set piece and a nice way to end the missions for Torino. It's also now that I'm realizing that the final mission in the Ballad of Gay Tony has to be a reference to this mission. As Luis ends up doing almost the same thing, chasing Bulgarin's plane by motorcycle, hopping on board, killing everyone on the plane, and jumping off as the plane explodes. Hail fellow, well met. Namaste. Peace, Carl, my brother. Hey, Truth, where you at? Back on the ground, the Truth returns, and somehow manages to top the insanity of the last mission. 
by asking CJ to break into Area 69 to steal a secret military project. You'll have to sneak through the base and have to be stealthy for as long as you can, avoiding guards and spotlights to make it to a control tower. You'll use the computer at the control tower to open the blast doors leading to the facility beneath the base, while also alerting every guard to your presence. Fighting through them and jumping down a vent to get below, you'll be in the main research base where the secret project is stored. Before heading towards whatever they have stored here, you'll need to hit up their control room to deactivate the base's defenses to help with your escape. Now it's just fighting through the facility's guards and navigating its confusing map to find the secret project. The absolute greatest vehicle in any GTA game, the jetpack. Now you just need to fly the hell out of there and drop it off to the truth at the nearby canyon. This is easily one of the best missions of the game. From its premise to its unique locale of a military base and research facility, to the finale of getting to use a jetpack to get the hell out of there, it all just gels so well. It also helps that the mission is fairly balanced, with some generous health and armor pickups, along with guards being spread out far enough from each other that they won't shred you to pieces if you're spotted. Returning to the airfield one last time, CJ finds the truth goofing around with his newly acquired jetpack. He asks CJ to attack a train with military guards on it, protecting some strange substance, giving you the jetpack to assist in the job. Flying out to the train, you'll be able to use your machine guns to kill the guards while still using the jetpack. Then you just have to smash the crates till you find the glowing green jar for the truth. It's not explained what the jar is, and CJ himself is curious as he asks the truth about it who only vaguely tells him that it's everything. Really hoping it's some alien goo and we didn't hand an unpredictable hippie weirdo a radioactive isotope or something. This completes the missions for the airfield, as it will now generate a max of $10,000 every few days. And even better, the jetpack will now spawn here to use. San Fierro a distant memory now, and our time in the desert coming to an end, it's time to meet Woozy in the city of gambling and broken dreams, Las Venturas. If it wasn't obvious by the strip and all the casinos, Las Venturas is based off of Las Vegas. And just like its real life counterpart, it's mainly run by organized crime. A fact our friend Woozy is discovering as he opens his own casino. Woozy has opened the Four Dragons Casino, which looks like it may have been inspired by the Red Dragon Casino from Rush Hour 2. The grand opening of his casino, however, hasn't been a smooth experience, as the competing casinos in town are all run by the mob. And they've been putting the squeeze on Woozy and the triads to force them to give the mob a cut of their profits. Though there's three big mafia players in town, the Sindacos, the Ferrellis, and the Leon family. And Woozy isn't quite sure who is coming after him. As always, it's up to CJ to sort things out. Though for once he'll get more out of it instead of being paid as a hired goon. Woozy, being the true friend that he is, offers CJ a stake in the casino. Making him a partner in thanks for everything he's done for the triads. After briefly celebrating their new partnership, one of the triad comes to reveal they captured a mob goon, who was trying to sabotage the casino. Instead of executing him, CJ suggests they torture the guy to find out who he's working for. Though instead of waterboarding him or, or clamping jumper cables to his nuts, we have him tied to the front of a car instead, while CJ drives around Las Venturas. You'll now have to fill up the scarometer by driving fast, making fast turns, and driving in the wrong lane of traffic being careful not to crash and accidentally kill him. Once he's sufficiently spooked, he spills the beans that he's working for the Sindaco family. Filling Woozy in, CJ suggests they hit the mob casino and rob them, but they'll need to come up with a plan and not just rush in blindly. Woozy believes they should first get their hands on some explosives in order to blow open the safe in their casino. CJ agrees and heads to the local quarry to get his hands on some dynamite, using a mining truck to break up four crates containing what he needs. Explosives in hand, you'll then have to use a bike and follow the red checkpoints to find a way out of the quarry, as the construction workers block the main entrance, dropping off the explosives to one of Woozy's guys when you're done. 
completing the mission unlocks a separate and optional set of missions from the regular triad ones, where CJ works with Woozy, Zero, and several others in planning out a heist to rob the Caligula Casino. For now though, I'll take care of the regular casino missions. Returning to Woozy, he finds out the mob are using more subtle attempts to sabotage him, this time trying to ruin his operation with fake casino chips. So CJ will have to destroy the Sendako family's plastic factory to stop them. This one can be tough, as despite the game telling you to sneak in or find an alternate route, the guards inside are alerted as soon as you walk in. If you're not wearing armor, they can kill you fast if you don't take cover, with one of the goons wielding a combat shotgun. So it's best to bait some outside before trying to pick off the rest while out of their range. Once it's safe, you can start destroying the molding machines around the warehouse. Just be quick as reinforcements will arrive. After all the machines are destroyed, you just need to get out of there and back to the casino to pass. This will wrap up the regular casino missions for now, but before I can start working towards the heist, the truth calls up needing some help. Apparently, he took some band and their manager on a peyote trip through the desert, but he has no clue what happened or where they are, as he woke up alone in Los Santos. You'll head out to the desert where the truth last remembered seeing them, finding the lead singer of the Gurning Chimps, Macker, and our old buddy from Vice City, Kent Paul, former manager of Love Fist. Chinel, I'm fucking hanging. Stone me, bloody crows. Oh, where am I? I don't know, mate. I was having a dream. I was wanking over with some fat bird's tits when this twat turned up. Turns out Macker ended up sabotaging their peyote trip by drugging everyone's drinks, resulting in everyone blacking out and getting lost. After the two Brits find their bearings, they ask CJ to take them to their buddy Rosie's casino in Las Venturas. On the way, the three try looking for the rest of the band, heading over to a local snake farm they vaguely remember visiting. They don't find their bandmates though, just angry locals they pissed off the night before. Running away, they decide to cut their losses and figure the rest of the band will turn up eventually. In the city, the casino they were referring to just so happens to be Caligula's Palace, our target for the upcoming heist. Not only that, but their buddy who runs the casino is none other than Ken Rosenberg. Oh god, my despair is complete. Okay, let him in. Rosie, how are you, me old son? I pray that one day I can escape my perpetual torment and retire in peace and comfort a million miles away from anyone I've ever fucking known, and instead, I get this? Turns out that after Tommy killed Sonny Forelli and took complete control of Vice City, Rosenberg was unable to keep his nose clean, driving a wedge between the two and ending their friendship, with the former lawyer heading to rehab to get himself clean. Once he was out though, the mob put him back to work, putting him in charge of managing Caligula's and making sure the families weren't ripping each other off, which has caused Rosenberg to go back to being his old neurotic mess of a self. Ken Paul will try to help him out and tell CJ he'll be in touch for more work. Nice. Now that we have an in with the Caligula Palace, this should make it all easier to pull off the heist. Meeting up with Woozy in the storage room of the casino, we start planning out the heist, with the first order of business being getting our hands on the Caligula's blueprints. CJ will need to grab a camera before heading to the Las Venturas planning department in order to commit some espionage. The blueprints are being guarded on the third floor, so you'll need to create a diversion. Hmm, maybe starting a fire by destroying these EC units will do the trick. The building will then be evacuated, giving you the chance to snap a photo of the blueprints. Then you just murder the helpful police officers trying to save you from the fire, and make it back to the casino. The next step in the plan is getting a casino keycard that will let the crew access the restricted areas at Caligula's Palace. And instead of just stealing it, CJ will need to win the affections of a young lady at the Caligula. Specifically the casino's croupier, Millie Perkins. You'll follow her as she leaves the casino and discover she has some pretty interesting hobbies. So CJ will have to look the part in order to win her over. Ah yes, very terrifying. Now it's just a matter of following her home, killing the actual gimp she was supposed to meet, 
and then showing her the time of her life. Come on in. I'm ready for you. You've been a naughty girl. Oh, I know. I know. Spit it out, filthy worm. You'll never break me. You'll then win over Millie as a new girlfriend. But you have to raise your relationship with her before she'll agree to give you the key card. It only takes three dates, so if you buy a house nearby and just save a few times between each date, you can get it done relatively fast. You can also just kill Millie during a date and steal the card from her house. But you wouldn't do that, would you? Whatever you decide, the next part of the plan is unlocked regardless. During the heist, the crew is going to need to cut the power to the casino in order to use the darkness and confusion to rob the safe. And the only logical way to accomplish that is by blowing up the generators at the local hydroelectric dam. CJ will need to grab a plane in order to sneakily parachute down to the dam's entrance. It's stealth time again, as you have to sneak past or kill the guards at the dam in order to place the charges on the generators. Taking a lovely dip in the lake outside after the mission's complete. The next part of the plan is making sure the crew can actually escape the casino with the money they plan to steal. CJ's plan is to steal and use a repainted armored truck to carry the cash. But they'll also need a police escort to act as outriders. Since the actual cops probably wouldn't help without a hefty bribe, some of the crew will pose as cops instead, which requires stealing four police bikes. You'll have to run around Las Venturas to find the four bikes, avoiding the cops as they give chase and driving them onto a Packard truck being driven by one of Woozy's men. The mission gives you a pretty generous timer of 12 minutes to get it all done, and outside of outrunning the cops, it's a fairly easy job. Just don't get run over on the highway after dropping off the bikes. This takes us to the final step of the plan, getting the armored truck. And once again, we have to take the most roundabout and absurd way to get the job done. Instead of just stealing an armored truck while it's driving around, we're instead going to use a military chopper with a winch to steal a truck instead. Yeah, that makes sense. To get the chopper, CJ will have to infiltrate a military depot, kill the soldiers guarding the place, and make his way up to the roof. Once up here, he'll then need to shoot down two gunships sent to stop him, before boarding the plane and flying out to nab the van with its winch. Nothing suspicious to see here, just a plane dragging a van all over the city. Totally normal stuff. That wraps up all the planning for the heist. It'll be a while till the plan is sprung into action, so it's time to help out our dear old friend, Ken Rosenberg. Oi, Rosie, liven yourself up. Carl's here. <sighs> Hello. What's happening? Hey, there's some top funny down at that pool, Pabsy. Eh? Leave it out, Dimlo. What's wrong with you? Well, are you going to tell him or shall I? I'm really screwed. As we've come to expect from him, he's a neurotic mess again. Partially because of the overwhelming amount of stress of having to manage a casino for three different mob families. But also because if something were to go wrong at the casino, like say, someone robbing it, or one family putting a hit on another, the blame falls on Rosenberg's shoulders. Which is the problem he's currently facing. As that guy we tortured by strapping him to a car, Johnny Sindaco, is in a coma at the hospital, with the Ferrelli family now moving to kill the guy. So CJ suggests that, you know, we move him first. You'll drive out to the hospital to get Johnny, but he's already been discharged. Looks like the Ferrellis got to him first. CJ will have to track the ambulance transporting him by crashing into different ones till he finds the abductors, then killing them and taking Johnny to the Sindaco's meat factory. Returning to Rosenberg, he's in good spirits again. Thanks to good old cocaine. Get this show on the road. The good doctor has revived the patient. Fine. Too high to worry about his troubles, CJ pumps him up to feel confident in himself again. The coked up ex-lawyer ready to go meet with the Sindacos, while also bringing CJ along just in case. 
Unsurprisingly, things go bad, as Johnny Sindaco has a massive heart attack after seeing CJ. Oh my head. Oh god. It's hit. hit. Oh! My heart. My heart. Damn, that nigga fucked up. You'll now have to kill all the Sindakos in the abattoir, while keeping Rosenberg alive. Who doesn't provide much support outside of putting out one fire? I guess it's the thought that counts. Once the pair escape, CJ will drop Rosenberg back off at the Caligula. But somehow, I don't think things are going to get easier for the cokehead. On the way back to the casino, we spot another person who's seen better days. And unfortunately, we're partially responsible for that fall from grace. Jump! Jump! Come on, jump! Come on, man, oh, jump! Shit. You got it! <laughs> hey, what's happening? Who's the idiot? That's some washed up rapper. It's Mad Dog. Used to be a real chart topping cat, real player. Mad Dog? Jump! Oh, man. It's Mad Dog, the rapper whose career we sabotaged in order to pump up that talentless idiot OG Loke. Since we left Los Santos, OG Loke actually blew up and released an album, though this was all because of Big Smoke, who hyped him up as the next big thing and funded his rap career, though really only as a way to launder his drug money. You can occasionally even hear the two talking on Radio Los Santos. Well, I assure you, OG Loke is the real thing. He's hated women all his life. He's sold drugs to school children. He's murdered innocent people just for kicks, but he rhymes like an angel. I was actually caught off guard the first time I encountered Mad Dog, as he never showed up in person before this point. And it's rare we end up seeing the people whose lives we ruined. CJ, filled with regret, tries to stop Mad Dog from killing himself. But when that doesn't look like it'll work, he steals a truck to catch Mad Dog when he jumps so he doesn't end up a stain on the pavement. Though cardboard boxes are a terrible way to cushion someone's fall. So you still need to take him to the hospital. As thanks for saving his life, Mad Dog will offer CJ a job as his new manager once he's out of rehab. CJ agrees and wishes him luck in his recovery. Sure hope he never finds out we're responsible for ruining his life in the first place. Returning to the Four Dragons Casino, Woozy honors his promise, as he has Ron Fa Lee and CJ sign a document to officially become partners at the casino. Though this doesn't actually mean anything gameplay-wise, as the casino doesn't generate extra cash for CJ, like you'd expect an asset to. It was supposedly planned, but ended up being cut. Same goes for why Ron Fa Lee is randomly here, as this cutscene would have taken place at the end of a mission where CJ had to protect the guy. But hey, it's the thought that counts. CJ making it big in the world, now the owner of a casino. Can't wait to tell Sweet if he ever gets out of jail. Despite his new status, CJ is still stuck helping out the cops, but hopefully for not much longer. Dropping in on Tenpenny and Pulaski, the gig is nearly up for them, as despite all the work CJ has put in, it was only a matter of time till the corruption got exposed. I mean, the fact that any witnesses who had evidence on them was constantly ending up dead probably just raised more suspicion. While CJ thinks he'll probably just worm his way out of it, Tenpenny disagrees, as he explains it to him. <laughs> Getting a little edgy, fellas? Oh! How you like that, you piece of shit? That give you any idea how edgy I am? Whoa! Get up, bitch! You paying attention? Looks like he's a bit on edge. That said, he still sends out CJ to go and buy him more time, this time killing a DEA and his FBI contact. They're meeting up in the mountains by the desert and have some heavy protection with the DEA agent taking off in a helicopter the second you're spotted, needing you to hop in the other helicopter to chase him around till he lands and you can kill him. Or, you could just skip all that hassle by picking up the jetpack on the way to their location, flying directly to the target, and killing him to take the evidence. Afterwards, Tenpenny will call and ask CJ to meet him at Las Brujas with the evidence. Huh, 
I wonder why he'd want to meet us in such a remote location. When Crash arrives, Pulaski takes the evidence and confirms that it's real. Before Tenpenny bashes Hernandez's head in with a shovel. No! You snitch piece of shit! You vato asshole! You sold us out! Turns out he was the snitch leaking all the info on his corruption to the higher ups. Unfortunately, this also means CJ has outlived his usefulness. As Tenpenny forces CJ to dig a grave big enough for himself and Hernandez. But the crooked cop makes two big mistakes before he leaves. First, leaving Pulaski in charge of executing CJ. And two, not finishing the job with Hernandez. You're the next one he's gonna silence, man. Shut the fuck up, scum! And it's Officer Pulaski to you! Fucking die! Thanks, Hernandez. I really wish you were more of a character and less of a prop. But what can you do? Despite having ample opportunity to still kill CJ, Pulaski takes off instead, so we need to give chase and finish him off. It's an annoying chase, mainly because of how awkward the buggy handles, along with how fast Pulaski's own car is. You'll follow him around for a while until you reach the town of Fort Carson, where he'll just circle around the streets, finally giving you an opportunity to box him in somewhere and light up his car, though he can still kill you if you're not careful, as you'll hop out of the car before it explodes and is packing a Desert Eagle. Not feeling so fucking full of yourself now, huh? <coughs> yeah, well, them's the brakes, fuck. Any last requests? Yeah. <laughs> Can I fuck your sister? You an asshole to the end. Punk motherfucker. Well, that's one shitty cop out of our lives. While I doubt Tenpenny will be crying at the loss of his buddy, I'm sure he won't be too keen that we killed him. No time to worry about that, though as our antics with the Sindaco family has caused a shitstorm for Ken Rosenberg. With the Sindakus out of the picture, it's a war between the remaining families to take control of the casino, with the Leone family's patriarch coming down himself to take control of Caligula's. And it's yet another familiar face, good old Salvatore Leone. Well, well, well. What do we got here? Also his future wife-to-be and all-around annoying person, Maria. I don't usually do this kind of shit, you know. <laughs> I like this girl. The pair both making reappearances from GTA 3. Rosenberg has basically been benched and is currently acting as a counterweight, keeping Macker and Kent Paul alive as they dangle from outside a window. CJ shows up to offer his services to Salvatore, mentioning that he worked with his son Joey back in Liberty City. The Don decides to give him a chance, asking CJ to intercept a hit squad of Ferrelli goons that are on their way to Las Venturas to kill him. Though, as always, it's not as simple as, say, ambushing them as they arrive at the airport. No, instead CJ will have to fly out into the middle of the ocean to intercept their plane, which involves hopping onto their plane and boarding it mid-flight. Good thing he wasn't sucked into the plane's engine. Rather interestingly, this is the one and only time in the game where the combat shifts to a first-person perspective, with CJ shooting and using cover to avoid their shots. Yeah, it's basically the same mechanics when you're using a stationary turret during some previous missions, but it was interesting to see them use it for a mission like this. Maybe they were thinking about doing a first-person GTA as early as this game. The Ferrelli's dead, you'll fly their plane back to Las Venturas for a job well done. Returning to Salvatore, he and Maria have grown closer, the old man teaching her to throw knives at Macker. Impressed with CJ's work, he has one last job for him. Another hit on the Ferrellis. This time in St. Mark's Bistro in Liberty City. CJ agrees, but asks if he can bring Kent Paul, Macker, and Rosenberg as backup. Which the old man agrees to. CJ cuts them loose though. It was just an excuse to save them from Salvatore. Telling the trio to leave Las Venturas and lie low. This has to be one of, if not the most memorable moment in all of San Andreas. There was just something so special about being able to return and see Liberty City again. Yeah, it only been like three years since that game, and you can't actually explore the city, but it was just so cool to see. Like the GTA trilogy had come full circle, as we end up right back where most of us started our journey with the series. That brief scene of Liberty City just covered in snow was so cool. 
And now there's a whole mod that adds snow to the original game. Definitely need to check that one out. Anywho, you go into the bistro, kill the Ferrellis, and go back home. Salvatore Leone will thank us for a job well done, and for supposedly killing Rosenberg and his friends. It's nice to see him be friendly and respectful to CJ. Time to make him regret it by ripping off his casino. Oh wait, gotta take this. Carl, what's up? It's your brother. Hey, what's up, man? You okay? Not really. I'm stuck in a cell between two lunatics. Oh, right. Forgot about Sweet. Not quite sure how I'm going to get him out of jail. Maybe I should just tattoo the prison's blueprints onto my back, get sent into the same jail, and break him out. Man, that show was so good when it debuted. Well, it's heist time. CJ will check in with the crew before heading over to Caligula's. Disguised as one of their croupiers. Using the keycard he got from Millie, he'll slip into the restricted area. Before tossing tear gas down a vent to knock out the guards protecting the safe. Once down below, Zero enacts the next step of their plan. Blowing up the explosives CJ had set at the dam, taking out the casino's power. Slapping on some night goggles to see, the next step is getting the rest of the crew inside which just requires lifting the gate with a forklift. Once inside, Woozy takes point to lead everyone to the vault. Or tries to. Everybody follow me! Damn! The devious bastards have changed the layout! Don't worry, I'll take the lead, boss. Good idea. Everybody, follow him! CJ and the crew will fight through the casino's security to the safe. But Zero reports someone is trying to bring the generators back up. Who, as it turns out, is Berkeley? As Zero blabbed to him about what they were going to do, for some stupid reason. After blowing up the generators, the crew will blow the safe, grab the cash, fight through more security, and finally return to the van. Here, they'll part ways, as CJ acts as a decoy for the crew to escape. He'll fight through the remaining security, up to the roof of the casino, before parachuting off the building to hijack a police helicopter. Or he would have, but Christ, I can never get a handle of these parachute controls. But thankfully, this game was made before Rockstar insisted on railroading players into scripted segments. So I can just steal a car to make my getaway. Reuniting with the crew at the airfield, CJ is still salty about the supply lines missions. So he does something he should have done halfway into this video. Zero, will you hide? I didn't mean to tell Berkeley. It just kind of came out, is all. We are watching, you idiot! Hey, CJ, calm down! You better take me home, CJ. And that's mission complete. Salvatore Leone calling up soon after, not too pleased, and threatening to kill CJ and everyone involved. Sup? You two-bit backstabbing piece of eggplant shit! Salvatore, nice to hear from you too. You're dead! Your friends are dead, your family's dead, I'm gonna fuck you up and your children and your grandchildren. Though he never ends up following up on those threats. Got ourselves another contender for best mission. From all the jobs that built up to the heist, the height itself with all its moving pieces, and even the dialogue during it, like all the jokes at Woozy's expense, it serves as a great finale to our adventures in Las Venturas. As while there's still one mission left here, it actually ends up taking us back to where we began, Los Santos. And we've made it. The final part of the game. Thanks to everyone who stuck it out and made it this far. This final part is a ride of highs and lows as while it's got some stellar moments and what I consider a satisfying ending, there are some parts in between that can really drag down the experience and just make you wish the game was over already. The transition back to Los Santos starts at the casino with CJ, Kenzel, and Woozy auditioning acts to play at the Four Dragons. After the latest performer comes up a little short, Mad Dog arrives to reveal he's clean and sober now, ready to revive his career. He wants to return home, but due to his drug habit, he lost his mansion to the drug dealer Big Papa. CJ, pissed, declares that they're all heading back to Los Santos, and that he'll get the mansion back. Making use of the triads for help again, CJ plans to assault the mansion in order to take it back by force. He and the triads parachute out of the plane and land on the roof of the mansion. 
immediately getting into a firefight with the Bargos. Then the group enters the mansion and continues their assault, CJ eventually finding and chasing after Big Papa. It ends with the two driving around the streets of Vinewood, finally cornering the drug lord and killing him. This will unlock Mad Dog's place as CJ's new base of operations. And before returning to the mansion, he'll call up Kent Paul to recruit him to assist with the rapper's career. During the next mission as Mad Dog is spitting rhymes, Torino reappears, screwing up the set by hijacking the sound system to recruit CJ for another job. Meeting him outside, he drives them out near the outskirts of San Fierro, promising to get Sweet out after this last job. Assuming CJ survives, as it's the most dangerous thing he's done for the feds so far. CJ will have to sneak onto the military ship in order to steal a jet, before flying out to take out some spy ships. When boarding the ship, you'll first have to deactivate its defenses before you can fly away with the jet. And while you can play it stealthy, it's probably just easier to shoot your way through instead. Once you've nabbed the Hydra jet, you'll get two other jets chasing you and need to shoot them down before taking out the spy boats. It's a little tricky due to the Hydra controlling different than other planes, as you have to use the right analog to control the direction of the thrusters, to change the altitude of the plane and to take off. This mission ends with you taking the Hydra back to your airstrip, unlocking it permanently to use. Returning to the mansion, Torino is waiting again. And a man of his word, he's got one last job for CJ. So what was that little job you was talking about, Torino? I just want you to go pick up your brother. Get out of here. Thanks, Torino. You're a dick. But at least you kept your promise. The Johnson brothers reuniting isn't the grand moment you'd expect it to be. As while CJ is excited that his brother is out and wants to show him all he's accomplished since he was locked up, Sweet immediately brushes off everything he's done. His one-track mind focused on what's happening in the hood. You never did get a did you, Carl? I need to go check on things in the hood. Man, that's the problem. You always a perpetrator, running from what's real. This attitude of his, the way he puts CJ down, the way he originally blamed him for their brother's death, just kind of makes me hate Sweet. He's such an ungrateful asshole. He puts himself in the hood on this huge pedestal, forgetting that CJ did most of the work at the beginning of the game, or that his whole obsession with the hood life is why he ended up in jail in the first place. And really, what does he have to show for his love for the hood? A dead brother, a dead mom, countless dead friends, no job or anything. This feels like a moment where CJ should really stand up to Sweet and call out his bullshit gangster lifestyle which you think is where it's going, with CJ driving his brother back to Grove Street to show him just how bad things are. But instead, it's up to them to once again go and save the hood, killing crack dealers and taking Grove Street back from the ballas, which is just the gang warfare mechanic from the beginning of the game again. And once it's done, Sweet's selfish ass insists his brother and sister visit him here in the hood, believing that working together, the hood will be saved. This wouldn't be so bad if Sweet ended up being humbled, finally realizing that that idolized hood life he believes in doesn't exist anymore. But that's not quite the direction the story decides to go. Leaving his dumbass in the hood for now, we return to Mad Dog for one more favor. With the homies, Man, that fake ass, ass lo- Loke. Lo but he's terrible. Motherfucker, I knew there was something familiar about those rhymes he was kicking. They're from my rhyme book. That's my money. And those are my hoes! He spots OG Loke on TV, realizing that Loke is using his rhymes from the stolen rhyme book. Still neglecting to admit he was involved, CJ teams up with Mad Dog to go drop in on OG Loke's music video. When they arrive and confront him, they'll chase after his fake ass all over Los Santos, first chasing him by hovercraft, and then by go-kart. Till they corner him at his studio, though surprisingly they don't kill him just intimidating his ass in front of a record producer, who now wants to sue OG Loke for his stolen rhymes and offer Mad Dog a record deal. They send OG Loke off to get them some lunch while Mad Dog takes his rhyme book back. Just a little bit of party. I heard you was down, so I got a gift from B-Dub. Come on now, I can't do that. Come on, sweet, come on. Make sure you enjoy this. Returning to check on our ungrateful brother, he has a crack whore trying to convince him to shoot up. CJ arrives just in time to put a stop to it. Sweet's flimsy reasoning being that since drugs destroy the hood, 
he might as well let it destroy him. If I was being kind, I could say that he's unable to cope with the fact that the hood he loved no longer exists. And being unable to better himself like his brother, that Sweet prefers to just go down with the hood. But enough time really hasn't passed for him to have that revelation. And despite him claiming they'd have to work at saving the hood, he pretty much gave up instantly. Maybe if they rearranged this mission to begin later, it would have worked better. But it feels like the devs didn't give themselves enough time to flesh out Sweetmore post-jail. After giving the crack whore the boot, CJ riles his brother up to go take out B-Dub, the drug dealer from earlier in the game. Rather lazily, we're doing another gang warfare mission in order to smoke out B-Dub. After taking Glen Park, we then have to fight off the guards around B-Dub's house. Finally confronting him, he explains the bigger push of drugs into the hood is all because of Big Smoke, who's become paranoid since making it to the top. He doesn't know where Smoke is, but let's slip that his lieutenants do, before trying to sick Big Bear on the Johnson brothers. Bear! Hey Bear, get the fuck out here! What's up, your lordship? Kill these motherfuckers, and I'll give you a whole quarter sack. Now handle that. Shoot him! The fuck is wrong with you? You ain't hear what the fuck I said? I'm tired Bear, of Bear, what the fuck you doing? I'm tired Come of on, man! And I'm tired of doing your fucking housework! So Big Bear finds the strength to stand up to beat up, declaring himself free, before swearing loyalty to Grove Street again. Not that it means anything, as he disappears from the plot when Sweet drives him off to rehab. Returning to Sweet, he's trying to rally up Grove Street to go show the other gangs that they're back. And you guessed it, it's another gang warfare mission to reclaim some territory. You could argue that maybe that's the point, that in stubbornly sticking to the hood life mentality, Sweet just ends up going in circles doing the same thing over and over again. But Christ, it really feels like filler. Like the devs blew their load with all the over-the-top missions they've done up until this point, and hoped that the gang warfare mechanic was popular enough to keep players' attention until the finale. Hey, be quiet, be quiet. Come on, you bunch of wankers. This is unbearable. Shut up. Officers Eddie Pulaski and Frank Tenpenny, both hardworking members of a community policing unit, have been charged with racketeering, corruption, narcotics, and sexual assault. They brought it on themselves. That bastard cost me my farm. And he hogged the bar. Fellow officer Ralph Pendleberry, who had threatened to turn state's evidence, and who was then found shot dead in a supposedly unrelated gang incident. I say 20 years. Airport. Try five years. Try Cops always get off easy. Yeah, I heard that. Lost evidence. Returning to the mansion, CJ and crew are watching Tenpenny's trial on TV. Despite the overwhelming evidence, the lack of key witnesses, specifically Hernandez and Pulaski, ends with Tenpenny getting acquitted. The crew is predictably in disbelief, but that's nothing compared to how the rest of the city is taking it, as full-blown riots have erupted all over the streets, with buildings on fire, cars blowing up, and people fighting and looting. The whole situation is based on the real-life LA riots in 1992 that occurred after the Rodney King trial ended with the police involved being acquitted. This permanently changes the behavior of NPCs on the map until the finale. So you'll constantly see rioting going on outside of missions. Man, I need your help. Man, I'm kind of busy right now with family shit. I helped you guys, hombre. It's time you help me and my homies. My hood screwed up too. We got this shitty neighborhood on lockdown now. Returning to Grove Street, Caesar comes to CJ for help in stopping the Vagos and taking back his hood from them. You'll recruit some Grove Street members before joining up with Caesar and his crew, moving through apartment blocks to kill the Vagos, but also doing your best to keep Caesar and his crew alive. Rather frustratingly, this stupid mission kept bugging out on me. Sometimes it took forever to actually recruit some Grove Street members as I couldn't lock onto them properly. Other times they would just ditch the car as I'm driving needing me to go find them or recruit someone else on my way to Caesar. Then, partway through the mission, when we reached the alleyway, Caesar or one of his men would instantly die after the cutscene, causing me to fail. I had no clue what was happening, as it just seemed to happen at random. Best I can guess is the regular NPC's writing might have been messing with the scripting of this mission. Eventually, after restarting the game and reloading my save, everything finally worked correctly so I could finish the mission. Unfortunately, we can't start the final mission yet, as in order to find Big Smoke, we need to take over enough territory in order to trigger the call from Sweet that he found his location, which requires taking over at least 20 pieces of territory, or about 35% of the map. And I just hate this. 
Like the previous sweet missions, it just feels like lazy filler. This is what I meant near the beginning about the mechanic resurfacing in an ugly way. With all the problems I had at the beginning still being true here, its only saving grace is that you should be completely strapped at this point of the game and can clear through these fights fast. Hell, do yourself a favor and get the jetpack to just hover above gangbangers as you shoot them, or fly up to a roof for protection. But you know what? Despite my complaints, going through these boring, repetitive gang warfare missions is worth it, as the final mission is just so damn good, and absolutely makes up for it. Hey, sweet! What's up? It's time for smoke. Alright, let's roll. The Johnson brothers finna take that fat fool down. Once you've got enough territory, Sweet will call. As the Johnson brothers plan to take down Big Smoke once and for all, they'll pull up to Smoke's crack fortress, which is locked down and under heavy security. CJ will tell Sweet to stay behind, so he can sort out this mess on his own. Since we can't shoot our way in, it's time to improvise. By making use of a police tank to just smash through the door and smush any ballers who try to stop us. We'll have to fight through three floors of security before we can make it to Smoke in his penthouse on the fourth floor. The first floor is the security area, filled with dozens of ballas. Nothing to it other than to just advance through to the next stairwell. Though a funny glitch happens where a police tank just bursts through the window. The second floor is the drug lab, filled with more gangbangers and Smoke's drug cooks. There's some explosive barrels here and there you could take advantage of to kill several enemies at once. The third floor is the ballas lounge made of several cramped rooms and hallways with very little cover. So you have to be careful before advancing through a room and avoid being out in the open for too long. Thankfully, each floor has a health and armor pickup on it. So if you run into a bad situation, you can heal yourself up before running back into the action. Finally, we'll ascend to the fourth floor and confront Big Smoke. Hey, Smoke! Hey, CJ, I was wondering when you would show up. How'd you know it was me? Knew it was my old dog, CJ. Knew you was coming and I don't give a shit. Big Smoke brushes CJ off, barely concerned he's there or anything that's happening outside of his penthouse. All he cares about is how he's made it to the top. His old friend questioning what happened to him and how he fell so far. Big Smoke brushes him off, unwilling to explain it to him before the former friends square off. What the fuck do you care? Uh, I guess we better do this shit then. Despite his size, Big Smoke is fast, as he can immediately rush in and start putting pressure on you. His flurry of sword slashes easily fills up your posture bar, and can potentially break it if you're not careful. You'll want to play aggressive. Don't be afraid to charge in and get your slashes in. Just watch for his sword thrust and make use of the Makiri counter. Also be careful with staying too far, as he will fire off several arrows and can wind up one large shot for a ton of damage. Okay, okay, the fighting is nothing like that, but could you imagine? Big Smoke's wearing a bulletproof vest that will soak up a lot of damage. He'll run around the penthouse stopping to take shots at you before moving again, summoning some of his goons to shoot at you too. Best strategy is just to use an assault rifle and aim for his head, chasing after him as he runs around stopping to kill any new minions that pop up. Partway through, he'll kill the lights, so you're supposed to pick up the thermal goggles that spawn in the room, but you can comfortably see without them and still shoot him. Once you whittled away his health, unlike Ryder, we do get a final death scene for Big Smoke. Hey Smoke, what made you flip out like that, man? Was it the drugs or what? I got caught up in the money, the power. I don't give a shit. Oh fuck, man. <coughs> Why you just didn't quit, man? We was like family, homie. I had no choice. I had to do it. I can't help but feel bad for Big Smoke. Everything went to his head. Unable to stop once he got what he wanted. Obsessed with making a name for himself and gaining more power. You can argue that Big Smoke is meant to be a dark mirror of CJ. And his own ambition to get ahead. But where CJ never forgot those around him and put loyalty above all else... Big Smoke only ever saw himself and no one else. Maybe if he had someone to lean on, someone like CJ, he could have been pulled back to the light. What a waste indeed. Carl Johnson, my man. I need you to do me another favor. 
CJ doesn't get much time to mourn his friend though, as Tenpenny finally reappears. He holds up CJ at gunpoint and forces him to empty Big Smoke's safe into a suitcase, planning to make a run for it by catching a plane out of Los Santos. Before he can execute CJ and leave though, he falls for the oldest trick in the book. Time to die. Ah, uh, sweet! What? Mother! It ain't over, Carl! It ain't over! Carl, you motherfucking piece of shit gang banging cocksucker! That asshole blows up the drug equipment on his way out, starting a fire that spreads fast throughout the whole building. With the power knocked out, you'll need to use the night vision goggles to see and make your escape, fighting through the remaining members of Smoke's crew, who stupidly decide it's better to try and kill CJ than get out of a burning building. You'll also have to put out some fires blocking your way as you descend the building. Once you escape, Tenpenny will take off on a fire truck, with Sweet running after and hanging on from the ladder on the back. You'll give chase for a while, avoiding the firebombs being tossed into the streets, until you need to catch Sweet when he starts losing his grip. Sweet will take over driving duties, following Tenpenny as you shoot at the police officers trying to stop you. There are tons of enemies going after you, so if you don't kill them quickly, they can destroy your car fast. Thankfully, if you do fail the mission, Restarting it takes you back to the fire truck chase, and you don't have to fight through the crack fortress all over again. Eventually, Tenpenny will end up losing control of the fire truck and crashing off a bridge, ending up on Grove Street. Fatally injured, he climbs out of the truck, cursing everyone and still refusing to accept what he's done. Assholes! You never understood what I did! Fifty of me, and this town would be okay. I took the trash out. I did. <laughs> and I do it all again. <laughs> Don't. Don't do it, man. He's gone. I just want to be sure it's over, man. That's all. It's cool. Don't need to put a bullet in him. He killed himself in a traffic accident. No one to blame. See you around, officer. Ten Penny dead, the crew go back to CJ's place, reflecting on what's happened and debating their next steps. They're soon joined by Mad Dog, Rosenberg, Macker, and Kemp Paul. All there to announce the good news that Mad Dog's record has gone gold. Celebrating his success, they all continue to discuss what to do next, before CJ decides to just step out and see how the streets are doing before the credits roll. Carl, where are you off to now? Finna hit the block, see what's happening. And that was Grand Theft Auto San Andreas. Christ, where do I even start? I think it goes without saying that I completely forgot how massive this game is considering how long this video is. This game is the culmination of everything that was built up in the previous two games. We have a massive open world that easily eclipsed any other game at the time of its release. One that felt alive with various locations that just invited player exploration. And thanks to the internet still being new around its release, allowed for all kinds of stories and myths to be born regarding what could possibly be hidden in the game. A combination of being able to swim and all these new vehicles like the jetpack or the hydra jet removed any hassle of exploring this huge world. You had three major cities that looked and felt different from each other, thanks to their designs, NPCs, cars, and mission types, with tons of little settlements scattered in between them, some with their own secrets that made it worth dropping by. There's a massive amount of side content to do, from the usual vehicle missions, to taking over gang turf, racing, robbing houses, dating various girlfriends, and more. Most of them actually feel worth doing, and not like another box to check off on the open world checklist. It added so many customization options for CJ, from his physique to his hair and clothing, really letting players personalize their experience. 
even if you don't get any real control over his personality and choices. It had this huge cast of memorable characters that, while some can feel a bit goofy, felt grounded enough that it didn't distract from the story. With Woozy being my favorite out of the entire bunch, with Mike Chirino a close second, and it was so great to see so many familiar faces from the previous two games. Seeing what became of some characters after Vice City, or fleshing out others a bit like Claude and Catalina before they showed up in GTA 3. Seeing so many of them in one game really helped sell that all three of these games were part of one connected world. While I think the story suffers from the same issues of GTA 3, where it feels more like a collection of loosely connected missions, I have to give props to its central villain, Officer Frank Tenpenny. He's always a constant presence through the game, and never misses a beat in reminding CJ of his almost untouchable authority. Tenpenny is constantly pulling the strings to manipulate everyone around him, always one step ahead of everyone. Samuel L. Jackson does an incredible job in portraying his arrogance and just how despicable he can be, making him one of the most memorable characters in all of Grand Theft Auto. I honestly can't think of a single GTA villain before or after this game that really measures up. This game gave us the most over-the-top and fun missions of the entire series. From raiding a military base to steal a jetpack, or pulling off an Ocean's Eleven-like heist, or just the simple nostalgia of returning to Liberty City for one more mission. Grand Theft Auto San Andreas feels like the absolute peak of the series, becoming the measuring stick that future games would always be compared to. Is it any surprise that both GTA 4 and 5 had such mixed reactions when compared to this game? 4 stripped back too much in favor of a more serious tone, losing the more out there set pieces and characters. While in my opinion, 5 moved too much in the other direction, trying too hard to replicate what San Andreas did right and coming up a little short. Though replaying the game has made me reflect on my feelings about GTA 5, as I think I've been judging the game for what it wasn't, as opposed to what it is. So, like I did for GTA 4, I think I'm going to revisit the game and play it objectively, to try and appreciate what it was doing instead of knocking it down because it feels overrated, to finally give it a fair chance. But we'll see how that goes when I make a video on it sometime in the future. To sum up my thoughts, San Andreas is peak GTA, a culmination of everything this series is known for, that set the bar insanely high for what these huge open world crime games should be with dozens of imitators trying and failing to reach that standard. I've had time to mull it over while working on this video the last few weeks, but I think I can confidently say that Grand Theft Auto San Andreas remains my favorite in the series, and it was great to revisit again, to make this absurdly long video discussing it and why I like it so much. And that's the video. Thanks for watching, guys. Oh man, I completely underestimated just how big this game was. I was so confident I could do it in two weeks, but as I kept playing, the game almost felt like it would never end. And as soon as I started my script, I knew I just couldn't half-ass it either. There were so many parts I rewrote because it felt lacking or I didn't say enough. Even now, at the end, I'm not sure if I said as much as I wanted to. I think I might start to reevaluate how I do these longer videos. As while the majority of you like this longer, more thorough mission by mission approach, I feel like I can find a way to be more efficient and get my points across clearer. The work on this video really left me drained. Thankfully, the next video will be the supercut of GTA 4, which requires a lot less work. Afterwards, I'm planning one last video to finish off the year before taking a nice break in January. By the way, let me know how my voice was throughout this. Thanks to all the recent channel growth, I was able to afford a much better mic. So I hope I came out much clearer and don't sound like the mic was in my mouth. Though there are some parts where I'm clearly losing my voice, so I'm sorry about that. Thanks to all your support, I felt reinvigorated to really work to make this channel grow even more. I'm not quite sure I want to lock myself into one niche of game. But I'm hoping when I experiment or do something different, you'll all still watch and enjoy. Again, thanks so much for watching. This video is long enough as it is, so I'm just going to wrap it up. Like, comment, subscribe, blah blah blah. I'm Fuzzy Slippers, and I'll see you later. Peace.